Abhi. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank yeah, you all. Bye. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome you all to uh, our today's second session. And this is the plenary one of ninth band drop talks, uh, the national congress of or the annual meeting of uh, Bangladesh Tropical Medicine and Toxicology Society. Uh, we have uh, three distinguished speakers today. I would uh, I will introduce them um, in coming in in coming time be, be just before their presentation and we. Uh, we also have three uh, distinguished panelists or uh, chairperson for this session. Uh, this whole plenary will be based on uh, COVID-19 infection. And uh, we, our first speaker will be Professor Sir Nick White. Uh, but unfortunately, he's uh, traveling now from uh, Myanmar to Thailand. So uh, we will probably skip to our second uh, speaker and uh, he will try to join in between. The second speaker is Professor Lia Katali, and our final speaker will be Professor Susanna Dunahi. Today, we have three distinguished panelists, Professor Mohammad Ridwanur Rahman, uh, Professor H.A.M. Nazmo Hassan, and uh, Professor Kazi Tariq Islam. I will also introduce them before, uh, uh, before the question answer session. So uh, not taking much long, I would like to first request Professor Liakot Ali. Uh, Professor Liakot Ali is a very distinguished scientist of uh, Bangladesh. Uh, he is currently the honorary advisor of uh, Pothikrit Institute of Health Science. Uh, he was the former vice chancellor of uh, Bangladesh University of Health Science. Very reputed scientist. His area of interest is diabetes. Particularly, uh, he had a uh, lot of contribution on physiology of insulin release. He is also the member of the National Steering Committee of uh, COVID-19 formed by the government of uh, Bangladesh. He is a fellow of Bangladesh Academy of Science, fellow of uh, New York Academy of Science, International Foundation for Science. He won Eli Lilly Prize from the International Diabetes Federation and many accolades to his, uh, to his bat. So uh, I would like to request uh, Professor Lia Katali uh, to uh, deliver his talk. He is going to talk on utility of different laboratory diagnostics in COVID-19. Sir, can you please uh, share your uh, talk with us? Thank you very much, Dr. Rabbi, for your kind introduction. Good afternoon to you all and uh, honored, uh, honorable uh, panelists here and all the distinguished guests. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers first for uh, inviting me to this very important meeting as a speaker. And uh, the inaugural uh, session was uh, already setting the path for the discussion today. It was a very nice inaugural session in the morning. And today, uh, being the first speaker, I would like to uh, again invite you to this uh, plenary session. Actually, uh, the pandemic, when it started, the Director General of WHO, he uh, emphasized on a point very uh, nicely, the test, test, and test. That was his uh, uh, very bold utterance that this is a central issue for the management of the pandemic. Unfortunately, we did not all follow that. But then from that then onwards, actually WHO released quite some guidelines. And in fact, this interim guidance is one of them where they suggested the uh, diagnostic test as the RT-PCR test. And fortunately, uh, from China, 
the sequence was released very early uh, of the COVID uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, and then uh, that enabled WHO to develop a, the first RT-PCR uh, kit. Actually, uh, even now that kit is used if you somebody wants to use it non-commercially, and uh, they also uh, gave certain guidance and also caution about the quality of the tests, which is uh, uh, at the root of the uh, um, controlling the pandemic in a proper way. And the quality of the test is very important. And in fact, actually, uh, they cautioned about the specimen quality, time of specimen collection, and we'll come to that, and also uh, handling of the specimens in a proper way, and technical reasons uh, inherent in the test itself, for example, in the, in the quality of the kit itself. So, uh, in fact, uh, CDC also followed uh, recommendations about the SARS-CoV-2 laboratory tests. And this is a recent addition about antigen also. It's not only nucleic acid, we are coming to that about the nucleic acid-based tests, but they have also added antigen tests recommended for to the diagnosis. And they also caution about certain uh, uh, utility of the tests where it should be used properly. And according to CDC, persons with mild COVID-19 symptoms, uh, if advised by the healthcare providers, of course, and uh, or who are self-isolating for more than 10 days, after symptom onset or more than 24 hours after fever resolution without antipyretics, improvement of other symptoms. Also, if there is a known close contact, that means according to the European definition, six feet uh, for more than 15 minutes, again, test and self-isolate. Uh, even if you have no COVID-19 symptoms and no close contact, actually healthcare provider may recommend, and in their recommendation, you may have to go for a test. Uh, uh, persons in high transmission area who attended a gathering of more than 10 people, in fact, in Bangladesh, almost everybody uh, uh, falls into this category without uh, widespread mask wearing, because we don't have that kind of mask wearing or physical distancing. So even then healthcare providers may advise the public health officials working in a nursing home or in a healthcare facility uh, or leave in or receive care in a nursing home and also critical infrastructure workers, healthcare workers and first responders. So this is the CDC recommendation which has been uh, in a large scale adopted uh, by the our uh, national uh, recommendations from our experts in the clinical recommendation guidelines. And also Infectious Disease Society of America, they have also released guidelines and not going into details. Now coming to our main point today, actually the clinical laboratory testing are mostly in, uh, in COVID-19 divided into a diagnostic type of tests and also serological testing. In many infectious diseases, serological testing may be used for diagnostic as well. But in COVID-19, we have to be very careful that this is not really used in a pro, you know, usual sense for diagnostic. Actually, the diagnostic test is mostly based on molecular testing. And as I have said it before, the CDC guideline and or many other guidelines have added antigen and in fact, in our country, we also propose that and in recent times it has been introduced. And molecular testing is the, uh, the uh, earliest uh, method which was suggested by all the uh, international bodies and national bodies. So uh, this molecular testing is a base, actually it is a NAT, nucleic acid amplification test. So nucleic acid amplification test is really the basic point and antigen is later, I will come to that. And then we have also serological testing that means antibody and serum, plasma, whole blood or finger prick. And we have several varieties. It's uh, based on lateral flow assay, 
uh, it is also uh, uh, have uh, can be luminescent ELISA or you can have a simple ELISA. So all these uh, varieties uh, are there. In fact, there are widespread use of other tests apart from the serological testing with different kinds of antibodies. We'll discuss that also. But there are other laboratory tests to monitor COVID-19 patients. Many of the respected professors in medicine here and uh, 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 clinicians are here and they have been using widely these biochemical and hematological tests. Actually, in today's discussion, we will not touch that because that's a very big area for post-COVID management or in fact, in, uh, during COVID management also, uh, during illness. But uh, that is a big area. We will not uh, discuss that today. Actually, we'll limit ourselves to the uh, more or less molecular testing, antigen testing, and serological testing. There are certain key considerations for labs when we are applying this molecular testing, serological or even biochemical monitoring, but uh, the key consideration for labs are uh, those are extensive uh, independent analytical validation. Limit of detection must be there. Sensitivity, inclusivity, cross-reactivity. These are all in FDA. They are available FDA templates for that. In fact, uh, these are one of the major problems in our country where initially uh, the kits used from uh, sources were not uh, having a even mark for proper limit of detection and limit of detection was too high. In fact, 200 copies per milliliter was the RNA limit detection by the mostly used kit in Bangladesh. So that is uh, a problem because not enough attention was given to this kind of only sensitivity or specificity does not speak of everything. And there are also issues of cross-reactivity. So all these uh, problems remain, but uh, these are uh, from today. Uh, in fact, the discussion uh, uh, is emphasizing uh, from the discussion, we should emphasize on the quality of the tests where validation should be checked by independent authorities. And strict pre-analytical operating procedures to reduce laboratory errors. That is another problem because when we are talking today, we are talking also in the, con the context of our country. Actually, the technicians are not trained. The transport mechanism was not very streamlined. And in fact, the quality control issues uh, were not particularly laboratory or pre-analytic -pre errors were not very clearly you know, addressed. Uh, considerations of time of testing and patient characteristics in test evaluation, because we'll come to that, uh, that uh, later on, that uh, the time of testing is very important. You can have uh, RNA uh, uh, you know, amplified uh, in later times, which may not reflect the viable virus and ongoing disease. So this is a very important fact in considering the laboratory test for COVID-19. And also, uh, actually, uh, we need a continued advocacy for appropriate clinical implementation of diagnostic tests, where really to use it, how to use it, and how to interpret it. If we go to molecular tests, uh, actually what it detects is viral RNA <clears throat> in samples swapped from the nose or throat. throat. Uh, we uh, typically rely on uh, reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, which is uh, in brief called RT-PCR technology. And in fact, uh, this is uh, to convert the viral RNA into DNA by an enzymatic method, and then by polymerase chain reaction, multiple copies of the genetic material for detection. Usually this is called the gold standard for clinical laboratory in diagnostic infection, as we said previously. In fact, uh, this is not the ultimate standard. Uh, the Sequencing is a better standard and viral culture is the ultimate standard. But these are not possible always in the clinical setting. And in fact, viral culture has not yet been possible in Bangladesh because we need a BSL-4 standard lab, which is not here. So we have to accept that the RT-PCR is the gold standard for clinical laboratory. It is all over the world, but uh, particularly in some countries, those are evaluated against the ultimate gold standards. But we have not, been, it is not, has not been possible here. 
And most PCR-based testing is carried out by highly skilled technicians. That is a problem which we have faced uh, uh, in Bangladesh. And this is relatively slow because it takes a time and that sometimes create a problem with the timing of the test. What are the specimen sources? Uh, we can use nasopharyngeal swabs or washes, oropharyngeal swabs, nasal aspirates. And also, uh, in fact, we can use also sputum, uh, bronchoalveolar fluid, lavis fluid, and tracheal aspirates in the respiratory tract. Uh, these give different kind of sensitivity and specificity, and we will see uh, in some real life situations. Uh, primary method it is, as I said, but there might be false negative result. It should not have false negative result, but due to improp improper sampling or handling, which WHO warned in the first slide I have shown, and low viral load uh, or viral mutation. And that is one of the reasons where initially even our rate of positivity was low and it varied between BSMMU and in many other centers because possibly during the collection and transport, the viral load became very, very reduced. And that's why it became uh, negative results. And it becomes undetectable around after 14 days of illness, although in some cases it may remain. We'll come to antibodies uh, later on. And uh, in fact, it is a typically a past infection. In some cases with very, very you know, uh, cautionary advice, we can have certain kind of idea about the infection ongoing. Uh, in uh, the specimen source, uh, actually most often blood or plasma, but you can take primary samples from saliva, sputum, or other biological fluids. Uh, it, it is a uh, delayed, uh, uh, we'll come to the different kind of uh, antibodies, uh, which gives different ideas about the timing. And, and uh, it is used mostly for surveillance, false negatives. Uh, it, it is possible to have false negative results in the uh, Past two weeks, it is um, sensitivity and uh, it is uh, low. Maybe it is still not clear whether we have a low antibody level in mild or asymptomatic disease. It may false positives because of the cross reactivity. And that is a question whether actually we have a lot of cross reactivity. We have already developed antibodies with, against other infections which is protecting us fortunately from the severity of COVID-19 because the death rate is really low here. <clears throat> so that is another question which we have to solve through antibody measurements. Uh, let us see some of the uh, uh, real life uh, uh, examples. Uh, this was a, a result which was published in Lancet. Uh, actually, uh, if we look at the serial viral load, and uh, in RT-PCR positive uh, uh, cases. And we see that with the uh, mean viral load uh, and with the days after symptom onset, if we look at the temporal relation, we can see that it is getting reduced over time. So this is a, uh, in the beginning days and it is very, very, linear relation, both in saliva or endotracheal levels. So it is an example from a study and viral loads, in fact, highs during the first week following the symptom onset. So this is, a, uh, uh, in fact, a, a relation with the time with the viral load. And in fact, sample type is very and disease stage. So if we look at the viral load by sample type, the, uh, we can see that the uh, uh, throat swabs, uh, we, we have uh, the highest of the main viral load. And also there is a, uh, uh, this is a throat swab, which is, gives the highest viral load. Also, there is sputum viral load by disease stage. If we look at the uh, here, and here, this is the early and progressive stage, which gives the highest viral load. So clinical disease stage and type of specimen all have to be very you know, carefully analyzed to look at the, uh, the possibility of getting the virus positive. And here we can see that uh, uh, different clinical specimens here are 
many types of clinical specimens, which was uh, reported in JAMA. And uh, here is a very good number of patients. And you can see that the uh, bronchoalveolar uh, uh, fluid uh, gave 93%, sputum gave 72%, and nasal swab gave 63%. So it depends from where we are collecting. In fact, uh, it, is, it may not be clinically possible to have always BAL, but we have to get as far as possible that kind of sample. If we look at the sensitivity and specificity based on clinical sample collection, if you look at the uh, different kind of studies, it, uh, it was in average of three studies where you get sensitivity of upper respiratory tract 76, lower respiratory tract 89. So there is a considerable specificity remains the same because in RT-PCR, it is very rare to have non-specific tests. So you, you can see specificity always very, very high, but sensitivity, can vary between upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract information uh, you know, uh, samples. And even within upper respiratory tract samples, you can have variation from nasopharyngeal 97 to nasal uh, to oral 56, and of course, uh, in saliva 85. So these are also certain kind of considerations when you are going for, for example, you are attempting for a nasopharyngeal swab but the technicians really do not know very nicely how to collect it. In that case, if you are sure that you are collecting saliva properly, you may have to go to saliva test. They, these are the you know, trade-offs. Sometimes you have to do a trade-off. And in fact, uh, the, uh, on, uh, another trade-off is whether convenient to the uh, patients, that is the compliance. And in fact, uh, I'll come to a later slide where saliva can be collected at home, transported to the laboratory. So you don't have to go for a specialist technician uh, collection center by technologist or technician. You can just uh, send it uh, from your home. So these are some of the considerations which has been you know, given here, because if you have a faulty nasopharyngeal swab or sending by a uh, process which is not really dependable, it takes days, or the even transport fluid is not very optimum. In that case, you may have to go to alternate samples because that gives, uh, if you have the 80 in saliva, if you get a nasopharyngeal swab, 40 collected, 70, then what you should prefer. So these are the considerations uh, for those. In fact, people have tried also in three studies, single test versus repeat test. You see repeat test is much more sensitive uh, compared to the single test. But in all these studies, there is not always head-to-head -head comparison because studies were done in different settings with different kind of uh, <laughs> precautions. So there might be certain kind of uncertainties. We have to have our own study in Bangladesh. Otherwise, it is not very much possible to interpret all results in, in our context. Now, uh, there are also relative study of hospital patients where there were potential uh, false result, positive uh, negative results in Wuhan, in China, even with RTPC results. And you can see that when they had an initial negative result, 48 uh, were confirmed positive on a second test, which is a quite big percentage, 2.5 percentage. So even in Wuhan, and they used a very sensitive uh, PCR that is called droplet PCR, uh, very, very sensitive RT PCR. But even then, you can see there might be uh, false negative unless uh, it's careful about every step. So, actually, uh, the about false negative results, uh, as I said, the false positive in RT PCR is very, very unusual unless there is a contamination. In fact, uh, false negative results. Uh, are a matter of uh, clinical uh, importance. Uh, actually, diagnostic testing will help in safely opening the country, but only if the tests are highly sensitive, validated under realistic conditions. So really, in how many cases are here? Well, we know that from the government data every day, uh, people really do not trust this data too much, uh, very much. And we, we know that, that the there are lots of gaps in the data presented 
by our authorities and everyday media. Why? Because these tests sometimes uh, are not really believed to be of high quality. So if we really want to burden our disease in our country, we need diagnostic testing with really good sensitivity validated. Also, uh, uh, in asymptomatic, the test sensitivity should be studied because in our country also, we know that a large percentage of people are asymptomatic. So we need a, a, a test sensitivity validated in our part of the world in real life situations. And uh, actually even negative results, we should be the clinicians are very important uh, part of the whole procedure. Actually, they have to have a very open eye that negative result does not always mean that we are ruling out the infection. Uh, they have to use their clinical judgment and uh, data from imaging, etc. And uh, actually, uh, the uh, thresholds thresholds have to be determined in various situations. Uh, in fact, the this is a very very important part. Uh, in fact, a few days back, when the antigen test, this is same for uh, all sensitivity and specificity measurement. In fact, when uh, antibody measurement uh, is particularly sensitive to that and antigen serology. In, in a few uh, uh, days back when the antigen test was introduced in our country, this was a funny that people uh, who are, were policymakers, they said, this will be done in peripheral areas where RTPC are not available, uh, is not available in 10 districts first, then 25 districts, in fact, if we use this test, any test with lower sensitivity, its sensitivity goes down tremendously when the prevalence of the disease is low. Uh, you see here, sensitivity and specificity depends on prevalence also, because there is another term called positive predictive value or negative predictive value. I'm not going into the technical details, in fact, the sensitivity specificity here is 90 and 95%. And if you go to a lower prevalence area, it goes down to 70%. And in fact, you can have so many false negative cases. So rather antigen tests should have been introduced in high density, high prevalence area like Dhaka. And it is never a replacement for RT-PCR test, but the, due to the lack of you know, awareness about this fact, it has been introduced in periphery, means in villages or other areas where actually prevalence of the disease is low. So we should be very careful about the application of the sensitivity and specificity parameters for any diagnostic test. And we have done a very big mistake with this antigen test introduced into low prevalence area, where uh, uh, based on the just argument that RT-PCR is not available. These are not actually rivals, these are complementary tests. Uh, in fact, uh, there is another specimen where you can get SARS-CoV-2 by RT-PCR after a long time even, in fact, after days or even weeks uh, after the symptom has been resolved. That is a stool. We must remember that the virus remains viable on an average up to seven days. After that, its capsule, lipid capsule is not really not uh, uh, remaining viable anymore because unless it can bind to the SC2 receptor, it cannot be internalized. It cannot hijack our machinery. The messenger RNA, uh, in fact, it remains uh, for a long, long time. In paleontology, even millions of years after you can get a messenger RNA or DNA multiplied. That does not mean that it is living. Messenger RNA or DNA itself is not living. So multiplying by a PCR, because RT-PCR tests can show a positive result in stool for after so many times, so many days. But that does mean that you have an ongoing disease. Uh, very rarely an ongoing disease remains after seven, you know, after seven or 14 days. The, uh, the consideration here is to, to combine with clinical judgment and other judgments. So uh, it, it must be cautioned that only way to detect a living virus is a viral culture, which is not possible in ordinary clinical settings. 
by rt pcr it is never a test which can tell you after certain period window that it is uh, detecting a living virus that means an ongoing disease rna itself cannot multiply when we do a pcr test in the lab in fact we kill the virus we actually lyse the capsule lipid capsule and we find a messenger rna so rt pcr itself is not a test where we measure any living virus now if we look at the window uh, even before the symptom onset we get uh, of course a pre symptomatic incubation period and then in the first week this is the highest pcr is likely to pose to be positive and then it falls and as i said up to it depends on the kit uh, with that kit you can have a positive result or you may not have a positive result depending on the sensitivity of the kit and then antibody starts to rise if you look at the igm antibodies this is something atypical because normally in other cases igm uh, appears very early within say 5 days but in case of covid 19 it is delayed sometimes it is parallel to igg and the igg antibody lives longer that's why it has been useful in monitoring the igg response is also not very uh, in in uh, all viral diseases there might be different kind of antibody response starting from iggm several varieties of iggg iggga and they may be involved in neutralization neutralization opsonization sensitization for nk cell killing sensitization of mast cells complement activation so not all antibodies does everything they have their specific functions and first cov2 antibody tests uh, we use different kind of test uh, you know the names because uh, some of them have been popular in media so rapid diagnostic test that is one kind of test uh, actually uh, for uh, more dependable analysis it is preferred that uh, we should go for a chemiluminescent amino assay which is at the bottom and the chemiluminescent amino assay is the best one and we have also enzyme linked immunosorbent assay which is ordinary elisa their sensitivity specificity varies varies tremendously but in some cases they may show only the presence of antiviral antibodies in some cases it is only qualitative yes or no elisa gives quantitative chemiluminescent elisa gives quantitative neutralizing activity is only me measured by either elisa or chemiluminescent elisa in recent times some rdt uh, rapid diagnostic tests is measuring specific neutralizing activity but it is much better that the quantitative tests are used because which level of antibody really protects us can be known by the sars antibody test uh, measurement properly uh, these are some of the uh, measurements which we, uh, we have seen in from different countries in our country one antibody result was given which was too unbelievably high 75% in slum area 46% on average in dhaka so that result was possibly withdrawn later because that was not really believable but we didn't don't have good data on antibody measurement in bangladesh and uh, so uh, according to symptoms also asymptomatic symptom there were certain uh, considerations that the you know uh, igg or uh, antibodies will vary tremendously between symptom and asymptomatic there is no consistent uh, difference among them and even neutralizing antibodies really uh, does not Uh, have a consistent uh, relation with symptom as symptoms but uh, the it is known that they develop after around 12 to 14 days uh, they they really uh, develop the neutralizing antibodies that is known so uh, will uh, there are also antibody differences between age and disease severity i'm not going to in the details due to you know, timing factor so there are actually age and disease severity factors in fact if you want to uh, measure the detection in swab and serology that also differs that does not have a consistent relation uh, we will uh, go to the epidemiological uh, evidence uh, which is which should be supported by serology that i have already discussed that depends on the prevalence of the disease where you are measuring you have to interpret very carefully 
how you are using the uh, sensitivity and specificity parameters in, in uh, antibody tests also. Briefly about the antigen tests, they detect about the viral, they detect the viral proteins. Potentially these are cheap and portable systems. Now the, uh, they are, the sensitivity is little low, 80% uh, on an average, 20% false negative, depending on the best kits available. And antigen-based tests now have a quantitative test. Ross already declared only a few days back that we have a quantitative test, chemiluminescence-based antigen test. Uh, actually, uh, the recommendation is that if you have a negative antigen test and symptoms present, the, the healthcare provider should advise for a confirmatory RT-PCR test. So this is the summary of the different kind of coronavirus tests. In molecular tests, there are several varieties which are simpler. Uh, actually, there are simpler uh, tests based on very point of care tests, even for molecular tests or uh, based on different kind of samples. Antigen tests, I have already discussed the, the limitations. Antibody tests, I have already discussed, but these are different types of tests available. There are also faster molecular tests. Uh, we, we are a little delayed in introducing that, but uh, uh, the CEPHID's gene expert tests have been introduced in our country. It is little, uh, relatively worse, slower, but Abbott's uh, ID now, and there are also tests which are simpler, so they have not been introduced yet. Uh, we, we would expect that those should be introduced. This is the basic principle of point of care antibody tests, which are rapid antibody tests. I'm not going to the principles, but uh, one point I should emphasize that uh, with, from other epidemics, we should learn that we should uh, go for the two-step diagnosis uh, by serology and RT-PCR. And I, uh, we are strongly in favor of, uh, of rapid screening tests. Uh, because these tests promise, uh, they are uh, they, they promise for ex inexpensive, rapid, easily mass produced, and don't require laboratory processing. In our country, the uh, biological bio safety is a matter of great concern. So we should go for screening tests. I'm giving an example because in the airport, for example, when we go for a X-ray screening of carry-on baggage at airports, that does not give a confirmatory test, but we uh, actually uh, screen a lot of unwanted materials in the airport itself. So your load on the test uh, is uh, on the uh, screening at the um, carrier gate is reduced. And I think we should follow the same principle. We should have antigen and antibody tests appropriately used. And uh, the key is to have a consistent rate of false positive and false negative. We have to have a good idea about that. Uh, uh, just a quick reminder, you have uh, two minutes left. Okay, sir. So I'm almost finished. And also, we should think about alternate specimens like saliva-based uh, tests, etc. In fact, we have a uh, actually the um, Dr. Rabbi introduced me as a member of the technical committee. No, actually, I am a member of the public health committee. We had uh, we have eight members in that committee, and Professor uh, Foyes uh, is a very important member of that committee. And we on Friday, uh, on 29 May 2020, actually uh, had a resolution of that committee, Public Health Advisory Committee. Uh, we had a resolution to introduce this kind of test, nucleic acid-based test, alternate options, gene expert-based test, point of care test, two stage confirmatory RNA detection test, saliva-based test, and also viral antigen-based tests. We uh, recommended for uh, antibody tests uh, and uh, in fact, we also communicated with the National Technical Advisory Committee and Professor Tarikul, uh, one of the panelists is here, and we got there also suggestion. In fact, uh, we submitted it to the government, but due to unknown reasons, all these tests have been delayed, only antigen tests have been recently introduced. Uh, we suggest that there must, must be DGDA involved for medical device registration guideline, which is already in place, clinical trial guideline, Private clinic laboratory related regulations should be there, and national, you know, uh, a committee for uh, uh, clinical management should be involved. Public health advisory groups should be involved. And in the morning, Professor Tarikul is saying about a re reference laboratory. In fact, there is a central reference laboratory in Agargaon, which should be activated. So, with all these, I think we have a lot of things to do regarding laboratory tests in Bangladesh, involving appropriate regulations, guidelines, action plans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. 
Thank you very much, sir. I'm very sorry to uh, slowing you down. It was really wonderful and compact. <laughs> it was really a wonderful and compact talk. Uh, I ha I can see pile of questions to you, sir, but uh, because of the constraint of time, I will pick uh, some important one. Before going to the questions, uh, may I request uh, Professor Ridwanur Rahman, sir? I think, sir, uh, has joined us, but uh, with a different idea or something, sir. If you can turn... Yes, sir. Now I can rename you, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> So, sir, first question to uh, uh, Professor Ali. It's uh, how gene expert-based diagnosis differs from classical RT-PCR-based diagnosis or nucleic acid amplification test. Actually, uh, in the uh, RT-PCR, we use primers and everything in a weight chemistry system. And in a weight chemistry system, uh, you have to have the laboratory set up with all the precautions for a uh, biosafety in a, in a greater way. But in the uh, gene expert system, we have everything in a CARTIS, in a CARTIS based system, which is already in a dry chemistry. System. In a dry chemistry system, you need less biosafety regulation, although, of course, there is a general laboratory safety always needed, and it is much quicker. And typically, it can give a, a result within 45 minutes. In case of RT PCR, the problem is we have to collect samples at batches, 48 or 96. Unless you load that, it is not cost effective, it is not possible. But in, uh, in a gene expert, we can even load four cartilages together. It is quicker also. So it is a just similar principle, but it is a cartilage based system. That is the difference. Another question, sir, from uh, Rangpur Medical College uh, that you have mentioned in your presentation that the nasopharyngeal swab has less than 70% sensitivity, where, whereas the saliva has 85%. Then why people are using nasopharyngeal swab in our country for collecting samples? I, I think there is a mistaken understanding. We showed that nasopharyngeal is 97% sensitivity. Actually, uh, I, I have shown that. Uh, but in some cases, uh, if you have a, you know, on a faulty collection or any other type of problems. I think in another slide that was uh, that was reduced to 70%. If you have a very low prevalence and faulty sample collection, faulty um, pre preparation, et cetera, et cetera. But the, uh, yes, from the saliva, the nasopharyngeal swab is higher. Uh, it is 97% in uh, usual sense. Yes, so the third question from Silet. Uh, although we are very late on introducing antigen-based tests, but can we prioritize antigen-based tests to enhance service to non-COVID non service? Can we use that for the non-COVID uh, services? No, actually it depends. We have to uh, generate data from our population. In fact, the particularly non-COVID, I don't know whether he's meaning asymptomatic ca cases, but because for non-COVID, there is no use of the antigen test at all. But if you mean asymptomatic COVID cases, uh, that means uh, I don't know uh, the what is the viral you know load in these cases and whether we should be able by antigen to pick that. Unless we do have our own study in a large scale, we cannot tell that. But this is always a screening test. We have to remember this is not a competitor of rt -PCA. It is not a confirmatory test we will have to use rational antigen test. That is the answer. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I mean, there are lots of lots of questions, but you. I have to make a pause Thank here. You. Now I would like Thank to... Uh, yeah, we can share the slides and they can that see... Will be very, that will be uh, very kind of you. That will be very... Now Thank I would you. like to move on uh, to our uh, second speaker, uh, Professor Susanna Dunahi. Uh, she is the Professor of Tropical and Infectious Disease, uh, University of Oxford. Uh, she is also the Wellcome Trust Intermediate Clinical Fellow and Honorary Consultant of Infectious Disease and Medical Microbiology. Uh, Professor uh, Susanna's research interest is tropical immunology, uh, malleodosis, uh, sh and uh, she, she basically tried to bridge the communicable disease with the non-communicable disease. Diabetes and infection is one of her very fa uh, favorite area. Uh, she already... Um, done substantial work on um, uh, immunology and COVID-19 infection. 
she had more than 100 articles in her uh, basket and nearly 5000 citations and uh, she is also uh, my she was also my phd supervisor so i'm very uh, proud and delighted to um, uh, present her today with our society professor susanna please uh, share your talk with us Hello, and thank you very much for the honour of speaking at this conference today. I'm very sorry not to be with you all in person. Um, Rabbi, would you confirm that you could see my slides, please? Yes, yes, it's very clear. Great. Okay, and may I apologise in advance for going quite fast. Uh, immunity to COVID-19 is a big topic, and I didn't want to miss things out, and I need time. So what I will do is I will make my slides available after the talk um, so you can catch up later. So my talk today is immunity to COVID-19. Who has it and how do I get it? I have previously been honoured uh, to visit Bangladesh. Um, I have visited a number of very esteemed institutions, including Dhaka Medical College, BSMMU and Burdham. I was hosted by uh, Dr. Chowdhury and I had the honour of meeting many of you. So thank you, my friends, uh, for hosting me today. So uh, this year uh, for all of us has been very different, hasn't it? So I, I am a researcher in neglected tropical diseases and I'm particularly interested in the bacterial disease melioidosis. And at the start of the year, it was going to be a great year because I was planning the world's first vaccine trial of a vaccine for melioidosis, and we were going to do this in Oxford. But this is what happened, COVID came along and got in the way. Um, and there's a number of key questions people ask, and obviously I don't have answers, um, but I have here thinking about this virus, um, so I can give you my opinions. The questions include, what do you require? Can you get this virus twice? Is it possible to get a COVID immunity passport? And there's been a lot of talk about this in the UK. The idea is you have a certificate to say you have antibodies or to say that you've had the infection or to say you've had the vaccine. And then you can show this and travel all over the world, go to a restaurant, do anything you like, go and see your elderly parents um, and everybody wants this. How well are the vaccines going to work? And will herd immunity work? number of questions. So uh, the situation in the world is still very bad. I gave a talk at Moro Bangkok five weeks ago and I took this figure on the left from the Guardian newspaper showing the world situation and there were 49 million cases and 1.2 million deaths. I updated it yesterday for this talk and just in five weeks it's gone to 72 million and 1.6 million deaths just over five weeks. The colours here show where it's going up and down, and you'll see it's now going down in America, which is about time because it's been really bad there. Uh, but it's going up in Europe. Um, it's going up in the Middle East. Um, interestingly, it seems to be going down a bit in Bangladesh. Um, I hope that's true. And this is data from uh, Worldometer uh, on Bangladesh. Um, we are very lucky to have... Um, uh, the esteemed talk from Professor Ali before me, which I enjoyed very much on your diagnostics in the country. Um, so that enables you to measure the cases, but I'm sure like UK, not everybody can have access to the testing. So hopefully it gives you a flavor of what is going on. I hope things are flattening for you. Um, but unless you can test everybody, it's difficult to know. So um, in April, uh, I came out of the lab and went onto the wards in my local hospital. This is called the John Radcliffe in Oxford. And usually I work in this building, a research institute called the Medawar building where Dr. Chowdhury did his defil with me. Um, and five of us researchers who all work on the same floor of this building, we found ourselves on the wards and we each had a COVID ward to run. Um, and what happened was a lot of our doctor and uh, nurse colleagues came up to us saying, OK, I've had the virus. Do you want to study my blood? Because we are T-cell immunologists. And yes, we did. We wanted to know what was going on. So the five of us, uh, this is me uh, in my PPE, but the five of us formed a merged laboratory at Medawa. So we pulled all our resources together and put all our teams together 
and we had a lot of Zoom meetings uh, like this. And when you, this will be familiar to many of you working on the wards, um, but when you uh, get infected with SARS-CoV-2, there's really a number of outcomes. So quite a lot of people have asymptomatic disease. And for a lot of people, it's a mild illness, particularly the young, but for some, it can be severe, um, causing a nasty pneumonia requiring hospitalization for oxygen and even death. And there's a lot of research on the practice determining the outcome. And we're particularly interested in the quality and the magnitude of the immune response. And uh, thinking about immunity to the virus. So um, please excuse my lack of scale here, um, but here is a person meeting the virus, the size of a beach ball. And actually you've got several arms of your immune system. So I think uh, your local immunity, so up your nose, and in your mouth is very important. And things like the mucus in your nose and the cilia background microbiome are going to be very important in your defense. And this is quite understudied. And then also your innate immunity. So things like how good your neutrophils are um, at zapping virus and macrophages and, and dendritic cells, and also uh, your genetic makeup. So we have these things called pattern recognition receptors such as toll-like receptors, and they recognize patterns on pathogens uh, that look bad. And in time, genetic studies will reveal why um, some people seem to be intrinsically more protected than others. But finally, adaptive immunity is important. And uh, this includes B cells making antibodies and T cells. So Oxford has been a very exciting place to be. Um, the head of my building, who was the co-supervisor for uh, Dr. Chowdhury's PhD, uh, was Paul Kleneman. And uh, Paul has overseen in Oxford all these work packages of immunology research, um, many, many, many of them. And you'll see that I, I'm just one piece of a jigsaw of many, many people. And this feeds into the vaccine trials, which are taking place in Oxford. And it also feeds into the recovery trial and other clinical trials. Um, and just the data integration is a big project. So first of all, thinking about antibodies, a number of my colleagues um, looked at antibody assays at scale. And uh, this is a paper you can look up where they looked at antibody platforms for the hospital and they compared the Abbott platform, uh, Diasaurin, uh, a homemade one called Oxford Immunoassay, the Roche platform and Siemens. And they compared red people who've never had the virus. This is usually historical controls from blood banks and so on. And blue people who've definitely had the virus who were PCR positive. And they looked to see which assays performed the best. And, you know, they all actually are pretty good. The Oxford one um, seems to be pretty specific. Um, but a lot of them have this long tail where some people who've had the virus have low level responses. In fact, when they looked over time, they found that nearly everybody does make a detectable antibody response by 20 days. It's just a matter of looking at the right moment in time. So after 20 days, nearly everybody makes antibodies. And there is a relationship with disease severity. So if you have severe disease, uh, you nearly always have antibodies afterwards. Um, if you have asymptomatic disease, you might not actually make antibodies. And uh, my colleagues did the most amazing staff testing program. So uh, they actually tested 11,000 hospital staff and they set up weekly uh, PCR uh, testing of nasopharyngeal swabs and uh, antibody tests were offered every two months. And they were able to study this and look at who got infected. And they found actually our peak was at the end of March and the people most likely to get effect, infected were people working in general medicine. And we think this was because these people, especially in early March, they were just seeing everybody in the hospital who comes in the front door and we weren't using PPE in early March um, unless we thought they had the virus. And it turned out lots of people had the virus and we didn't know it. So we think that's when these people got infected. And a particularly interesting, was our intensive care staff were not particularly at increased risk. And we think this is because they had very good level two PPE um, and they had very good training uh, to use this. Um, so that might be the case. 
And we actually also think that a lot of our staff to staff transition was not, um, sorry, a lot of our staff infection was not actually from, um, not actually from patients, but it was staff to staff in the coffee breaks and so on. So we got a lot stricter on social distancing. Um, in terms of how long the antibodies last, this is one of my colleagues, and he has shown uh, uh, that looking at 12,000 people, they had 3,000 people with a positive antibody result, and they found that in time they do go down, um, but at 200 days they are still detectable, and time will tell uh, whether they disappear. But when people talk about antibodies disappearing, they don't really disappear. You're likely to have those memory B cells, your plasma cells, your memory B cells are likely to be there in you. And if you meet the virus again, they will multiply and produce antibodies again. The UK government has done a number of serious surveillance studies where they take a random group of people every week and check their antibodies. And what we found is that the proportion of the population with antibodies has peaked at about 15%, and, uh, and that's in London. Um, but actually, we've still got a very long way to go in terms of herd immunity in the whole population. Um, this is a scientific study from Brazil, um, and this was in Science recently. It's quite a remarkable study because this is a city in Brazil called Manaus, uh, which is quite a young population um, and very crowded. And they actually found that 75% um, of the population had antibodies uh, by, by the end of this year. Um, so it just goes to show that if you really let a virus run loose through, the, through a population with very little um, intervention, three quarters of the population do acquire antibodies. And this compares to Sao Paulo, uh, another Brazilian city where the investigators looked as well, where it was much, much lower. And really what this tells me is that if London only 15% are immune, we've still got a very long way to go. And it's not that there's other immune things as well that we're missing, although that's part of the story. This is another interesting story. So this was um, a fishing boat in America um, and 122 uh, fishermen uh, went on the boat for a trip and before they left, somebody took their blood and uh, they found that only three people uh, before they left had antibodies to the virus. And guess what? By the time they came back, they'd nearly all been infected. So somebody went on that boat with the virus. And when they came back, 85 percent of people had had the virus. It's an extraordinarily high attack rate. And that shows what happens if you put people on a really closed environment. Interestingly, the three people who had antibodies before the boat left did not get infected. Um, so this is very low numbers, but it does suggest that antibodies um, are helpful. And this is the same study and just showing um, here are the people uh, who had uh, antibodies at the beginning and didn't get infected. And this is their antibody levels. And the light blue is everybody else. So everybody else, nothing at the beginning and they came up. And this shows uh, that all the people who were PCR positive when they came back were from the same clade. So it's the same person. It wasn't that lots of people went on the boat with the infection. Very interesting paper. Um, and the last thing to see on antibodies is that uh, if anybody in Bangladesh is wanting to scale up antibody testing, I have a wonderful professor in Oxford, Professor Alan Townsend, who has made a um, IHA assay, which is very, very scalable. And he is willing to send you for free a kit uh, to scale this up for up to 10,000 people. And he will offer remote support in your lab setting this up. So uh, please let me know if anyone would like to be put in touch with him. Um, and so the next thing is the T cells. So in the UK, um, a lot of people are saying, OK, if we don't have antibodies, maybe we have T cells. And in fact, it's become very, very political. I have spent my career working on T cells and I never expected T cells to become political. And people who are very, very right wing and try to say, um, okay, uh, this virus is all a fuss over nothing and we should all relax and not do anything. 
Um, they're saying, don't worry, we've all got T cells. And these are not immunologists, it's people who support Donald Trump or whatever. And it's quite strange because if any of us put out a research paper, it's immediately picked up and tweeted uh, by the people who think that COVID is all a hoax. And they say, look, we've all got T cells, don't worry. Well, we have looked in a lot of detail. These are some collaborators of mine in California. This is a very nice paper that came out quite early. This was the first big paper demonstrating T cell responses to the virus. Um, but remember, there are other coronaviruses out there. So there's at least seven that are important to humans. And there were four that cause common colds, these four. They're known as human coronaviruses or seasonal coronaviruses. And that's in addition to the original SARS, MERS and SARS-CoV-2. And these can cause cross-reactivity. So our lab at Medawa have looked in great detail at T cell responses in healthcare workers. And what we found um, is that after you have had the virus, most people, but not everybody, make affected T cell responses. This is called an Elispot assay. And we can measure responses to spike and the structural and accessory proteins and so on. And uh, we also have an assay which brings out central memory T cells. These are T cells that lurk deep within you uh, and are sleeping. And if you spend a week uh, culturing people's T cells with the antigens you're interested in, you can wake them up. And we found a pattern of responses uh, that suggested people have had SARS-CoV-2. These are responses to the membrane protein and the nuclear capsid protein. So if you want to read more, this is our preprint, which is currently under review at Nature Comms. Interestingly though, we looked at a load of healthy people. So we took blood from lots of people we know haven't had the virus. These are either people um, who we had stored cells in our freezer from last year, or people um, who are PCR negative and have had no symptoms and have no antibodies. And slightly to our surprise, we found that 90% of people who have not had COVID actually have deep memory T cells within them that can recognize this virus. And these must be cross-reactive. Um, they recognize spike and they must be recognizing spike perhaps from common cold viruses. And we've used these studies to look at people who don't know if they've had the virus or not. So we looked at a bunch of doctors who thought they'd had the virus, but had no antibodies. And when we look at these people who think they've had the virus uh, and have no antibodies, we were able to find patterns of responses in their T cells that suggest they've had the virus. So the, to conclude the T cell part of my talk, um, we can find cross-reactive T cell responses depending which assay we use. If we use prolonged stimulation, so if we spend a week culturing the cells, we can recognize T cell responses to spike protein in nearly everybody. We can also identify a specific pattern of T cell responses in people who've had the infection. And this is a, a good way to tell apart people who have and haven't had the infection. But we don't yet know what these T cells mean for protection. So moving forward, we're doing a national study in the UK um, to measure T cells in healthcare workers and look and see how they relate to protection and how they relate to response to vaccines. And this is an example of our study. We recruited an entire year of medical students in our hospital. They were new clinical students who hadn't been on the wards yet. And uh, in one day, uh, we took blood from 100 people of students and we also measure um, their nasal mucosa as well. So we'll see what happens to this cohort. We did this at the beginning of October and out of 100 people already, six of them have caught the virus. So we can compare their cells before and after. And we've also had the opportunity to study this in Bangladesh. So I have a, a PhD student called Mohammed Ali and he, um, is with me in Oxford at the moment and he was part of our team in the spring looking at the Oxford healthcare workers and so we formed a collaborator uh, 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 a, a collaboration uh, with Dr Chowdhury as the um, principal investigator in Bangladesh and uh, Ali was able to go over uh, with all these suitcases of lab materials um, to set up a study looking at the impact of diabetes 
on immune responses to the virus um, in COVID. So he is now back with his samples and uh, will be working this route. So thank you to everybody for the collaboration. Um, I want to talk a bit about herd immunity. So a lot of people are saying, look, just relax and let the virus run through the population. This is what they did in that Brazilian city of Manaus. And if everybody became immune uh, without us doing anything, it would be fantastic. Um, we'd just get the virus over and done with. Um, however, letting uh, herd immunity take place uh, without a vaccine is actually very cruel. It is what we call Darwinian because it just kills off the weak people in society. Um, it's very, very difficult uh, for cultures uh, like Europe where we have a lot of old people and we don't want them to die from a virus. Um, and as I say, the seroprevalence studies show we still have a very long way to go. We are concerned that people might get reinfected. We know that if you have the common cold, you can get it again after a year. And if these T cells were great, uh, why would we have a pandemic? And we see these very high attack rates on closed communities. However, we do think if you have the virus once, you're likely to have some partial immunity. For example, if you have the virus and you survive, you may get less severe disease the second time. The last thing I want to talk about is vaccines, um, which has been so, so exciting. Um, every year I give a talk to our medical students on vaccines and every year I get my talk out and check it's okay and I, I'm good to go. And this year I had to rewrite it and it took me a long time because this year has changed the face of vaccines. And I also wondered what I'll be doing next year. So very exciting, lots of vaccines in development. Um, I'm going to talk about the Oxford one first because I'm very, very biased. Um, I am a part of this vaccine study. Um, and this study um, uses spike protein and we have a harmless virus. Uh, it's like a common cold virus, an adenovirus. And uh, we put um, the code for the spike protein into the virus and we inject the virus into people. This virus can't replicate, it's replication deficient. Um, so it gets into people just enough to tell the body to make the spike protein and you then get a response. So uh, this was the results of the safety and immunogenicity study um, that came out a few months ago. This was when uh, Prince William uh, visited the lab. This is Professor Andy Pollard, the chief investigator. Um, and I would say that I did my PhD in this uh, at Jenner uh, and we have spent 30 years preparing for this. And the vaccine is immunogenic, we make antibodies, um, we get T cells as well. And then the efficacy was released recently. So um, the efficacy showed uh, if you have the standard dose, uh, it looked like 62% efficacy, um, but some people got a lower dose, which wasn't intended. Um, but as soon as they realized people got a lower dose, uh, they changed the plan to study that. And the lower dose efficacy is around 90%. So that's the dose that's been taken forward. This is very, very exciting for us. We're just waiting for the vaccine to be licensed in the UK. The thing is that this vaccine is very cheap. It is $2 a dose and can be rolled out around the world. It does need to be kept in the fridge at four degrees, but countries are used to handling vaccines like that. So we really think this can be rolled out around the world and it's very exciting. Um, but meanwhile, we got overtaken by the Pfizer vaccine. And I have to tell you that even in Oxford, we're super, super excited about these mRNA vaccines. We never thought we would see efficacy so good. So when we heard that Pfizer and Moderna were producing 90, 95% efficacy, we were overjoyed because it means that we can have power against this virus. So these messenger RNA vaccines are amazing. They're pretty new. And what you do is you put messenger RNA inside kind of inert lipid nanoparticle and this is just like a Trojan horse package that allows the messenger RNA to be delivered inside your cells. And then the messenger RNA tells the body how to make antibodies and T cells. But what's fascinating to immunologists is how do they manage to get the balance right? Because the thing is, if you give foreign messenger RNA to people, it's kind of exciting and it sets off your toll-like receptor three receptors and all sorts of bits of your immune system get alarmed. 
And what Pfizer have done is they've adapted it. They've got a pseudo uracil modiety. So they've got something that, that makes it a bit less exciting. So it doesn't cause too much of a reaction in the body, but just enough reaction to get those antibodies and T cells going. It's really incredible. And they've got a very nice website if you want to read more. And then their efficacy is just astonishing. And one thing about their efficacy is that it works really quickly. And I have to confess on Saturday afternoon, I went to my hospital and I received a dose of the Pfizer vaccine. And to me, this was a big betrayal because I, I, I'm part of the Oxford vaccine plan, but the Oxford vaccine is not licensed yet in the UK. Um, and so I was actually a participant in the Oxford vaccine trial and they had to unblind me and they told me I'd, I was in the placebo arm. And therefore I went ahead and had a dose. And what's interesting to me is that um, this is the efficacy of the vaccine over 120 days. And the inset is in more detail, 21 days. And what's interesting to me is that here are the people who've had the vaccine and here are the people who've had the placebo. And for the first 10 days, they look the same. Um, but after 10 days, they start to diverge greatly. So I think the vaccine starts to work at day 10. And remember, this is exposure from day five, because by the time you get the sick, you are already five days into your exposure. So probably the vaccine is starting to work already. And I'll get a second dose. I'm a very lucky person. I managed to get this because I live in Oxford and I'm on the wards. So I'm going on the wards after Christmas, where I'll probably be running a COVID ward again, given the way things are going in the UK. Um, and what we need is for the rest of the world to get vaccinated. The problem with these messenger RNA vaccines, they're very new technology and they're very fragile. So they have to be kept at minus 80. And this is pretty hopeless. Even in the UK, it's really, really difficult. So all our main distribution centers are big hospitals and it's very difficult for the community in rural areas. So clearly for Bangladesh and many parts of the world, uh, this is difficult. They're also more expensive. So they're 30, they're $30, um, which, which puts them out of reach of being cost effective in many countries. And I, I, I actually think uh, th this is very exciting technology, but we need a cheaper and more pragmatic solution for the world. Finally, we have a problem in the UK with vaccine he hesitancy. Uh, Dr. Chowdhury says not such a problem in Bangladesh, which I'm pleased about. But if you look at people in Britain, you'll find five to 10% are very fixed pro-vaccine. And I put myself in that camp and five to 10% are slightly mad and think vaccines are all a con conspiracy to, by the government to harm us. And everyone else is a bit cautious and needs very careful messaging to convince them that a vaccine is a good idea. So key, just to finish with some key pragmatic questions and what my opinion is, first of all, why do some people, like the elderly and people with diabetes, why are they more susceptible to severe disease? I think this is a number of reasons. Um, I think your immune system does decline as you get older. Um, I think also the existence of ischemic heart disease, I think is important. There's something about this virus that causes harm vascular harm to people, um, but we need more research to work this out. Why do children have such mild disease? Um, so a lot of, a lot of infections cause a, a, what we call a J-shaped curve where young children actually get quite severe disease. And we can see this in flu, but in COVID-19, it's just a, a straight line of increasing severity the older you are. It might be that children, um, because they have so many common colds recently, they have such high cross reactivity. That might be, and it, that might be why. It might be because they're so healthy and they've got no atherosclerosis. Um, there might be other factors. So we're we're doing a study looking specifically at the immune responses in kids. What's the contribution of protective immunity from cross reactivity? So this. this uh, reactions to common colds, what does that mean? So I think it's going to be important, um, and this might be why kids have milder disease, um, but it can't be the full picture because over 90% of adults have antibodies to common cold viruses, and we wouldn't have a pandemic and we wouldn't see these high attack rates if these were completely protective. And a lot of our work in the next 12 months will address this. If someone's had the virus, will they get it again? So, so far, um, actually, it's quite reassuring. 
you can catch it again. Um, there are stories around the world. In the UK, apparently there's 500 cases in the UK where Public Health England is investigating if it's a second infection. It does seem to be an issue with people, hemodialysis patients, for example. Um, but by and large, so far in six months, we're finding people, the majority of people don't catch it again. And it's likely that if people catch it again, they may be less sick. How long does immunity last? Uh, we don't know yet, but there seems to be good immunity at six months from what we can see so far. Um, if you have asymptomatic infection, is that the same? Is that as good? And there's some evidence suggesting your immunity is stronger if you've had more severe disease, uh, really because you've had a bigger fire burden. Um, and that's likely the reason. But we need more research. What about vaccines? Uh, are they going to work? Can they give you the same or better immunity? And what about vulnerable people? Will the vaccine work on them? We're hoping that the vaccine is, gives you super immunity that's even better than natural immunity. Um, but time will tell. And we're hoping it works in elderly, frail people, people with compromised immune systems. Again, that's something we're looking into. Um, and will vaccines stop people being infectious or just prevent disease? So one possibility is you get the vaccine and you still get the disease, but very mildly. Um, will it prevent transmission? There's some evidence from the Oxford vaccine that it does reduce asymptomatic disease as well, um, but time will tell. So in summary, nearly everybody makes antibodies after you've had the virus. Um, the seroprevalence to the virus remains low in the UK, despite um, nearly 2 million cases. Um, T cells look important, and we have identified a characteristic pattern. Most people in the UK have cross-reactive responses to spike on central memory, but we don't know yet if these responses are protective, harmful, or actually not relevant. High attack rates in closed communities suggest cross-reactive immunity can't protect everyone, and ongoing work is going to address how long this immunity lasts. There are many, many people involved in this work, as you can imagine, and Thank you to Dr. Chowdhury and my Bangladeshi colleagues for collaboration. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Susanna. Uh, basically, in your pragmatic uh, question slide, you have answered <laughs> many of the questions which came to me. However, I would like to uh, ask you some from uh, from the panelists and uh, our senior uh, members. One first question would be, uh, is there any immunological basis of uh, low case fatality rate in Asia or Asia Pacific region uh, compared to Europe or West? Anything with uh, the existing infectious diseases or the universal BCG vaccination coverage or anything else? Thank you very much. So we are so, so interested in this. I understand you have a quite a bad problem in Bangladesh and your hospitals are busy with viral pneumonia, but actually your hospitalized case fatality rate from what you've told me is actually a lot lower than ours. And this is very interesting. Uh, even more interesting is countries like Thailand uh, who, who have really had very, very low levels of cases despite actually having the first recorded case outside of China. Um, so just taking that in two parts, I think uh, the, the age structure of a population is important. So if your country is, is younger um, overall, um, you're gonna see less severe disease, um, lower rates of um, ischemic heart disease, I think are important, lower rates of diabetes, but you know, in urban Dhaka, you have an awful lot of diabetes and you have ischemic heart disease and obesity. So there may be other factors, genetic. Um, it might be exposure to other viruses. Um, I'm also doing a project in Thailand to see if, for example, exposure to other bat coronaviruses, because there's about 100 out there, are important. So there may be other exposure differences and genetic differences. Thank you. And the uh, second question is, uh, <clears throat> you have already said about the persistence of antibody after exposure. So uh, how long the antibody could persist after getting a vaccine? Yeah, so I, I think we're going to have to have some time to answer that. But 
pretty soon they'll be able to model it. So what they do is um, they look at the rate of decline of antibodies and then extrapolate into the future. And they look at um, other uh, antibodies in other diseases and how fast they decline. And then they'll start speculating from there. I think a lot of people in the field are thinking that it might become an annual vaccine once a year. So in the UK, we try to give vulnerable people an annual flu jab, and perhaps one day it will be a combined flu and coronavirus jab. Um, but I don't know. I think given the common cold, uh, if you look at the literature for antibodies for common cold coronaviruses, they do seem to decline um, over a year. Thank you. So uh, we'll take the last question. I mean, I will. <clears throat> I would also like to invite the panelists. Uh, you, if you have any question, please feel free to ask uh, directly to Susie. Uh, I will take one question from um, IDC here. Uh, when do we start having enough protection after vaccination? So probably he meant that vaccination is not only meant by individual protection, it's actually a community protection like mm -hmm. other vaccines. So uh, when do we start having that uh, protection at community level and after, after you the mean like a herd immunity? Some hmm. yeah. mass vaccination, uh, when can we get? Yeah, the herd immunity is likely to require quite high rates of vaccination. I mean, it depends a bit on the R number. So something like measles, which has a very high R of about 10, you need about 95% vaccination. Um, I think with COVID, I've seen modeling suggesting you might need 70% of the population vaccinated. And that's quite difficult to achieve. Um, and in the UK, we might see um, the, the bottom of the queue is the young people. Um, I didn't mention, but one of my jobs in the university was overseeing testing of our university students. And the, the virus just spreads like wildfire between students living in uh, student halls. And we had about a thousand cases in the university <clears throat> in undergraduates living in halls. And it was so mild in that population, a very, very mild illness. Um, and we managed to contain it. So the students didn't give it to anyone else, but they gave it to each other. And uh, I think the difficulty is uh, they're not gonna be a priority for vaccination because uh, they, they don't get sick, but uh, they, they, they potentially spread it to their older family members. So ideally you vaccinate everybody, but it will take a long, long time. Uh, Dr. Susanna, I'm uh, Dr. Islam. Uh, actually, I, I have one question to you and one comment uh, regarding your presentation. Uh, if we compare uh, the vaccine of Pfizer and vaccine from Oxford, as a clinician, I'm Professor of Medicine, as a clinician, if you ask me, I must wait for the vaccine from Oxford for many reasons, because I don't want to detail, because you have already described. Uh, not only cheap uh, uh, transportation, storage, and many, many advantages are there. Why UK jump first for Pfizer vaccine? This is my question to you. Yeah. And my comments uh, regarding cross uh, immunity or cross reactivity, I uh, read one paper uh, in the journal uh, because it, you know, during this pandemic, there is infodemic. There are a lot of information. Which one you will take? It is very difficult sometimes. So they claim that mums, uh, Mizella and rubella, MMR vaccinated countries where Bangladesh is doing very, Bangladesh did very lot good uh, in the past as well as BCG vaccination, Bangladesh got a word from even for total uh, immunization program, as well as the member of pan corona uh, family. Usually our children as group used to suffer in their childhood. Does this tree, uh, any of or combination of any, that can protect our children as group or younger as group. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for your very wise questions. So to take the first question, why did the UK, including Oxford, jump on Pfizer and not wait for the Oxford vaccine? The simple reason is we're, it's a race against time. So people are dying. We have about 500 deaths a day at the moment. So because Pfizer got licensed first, that's why we took it. But the UK government didn't order many doses of Pfizer. So we'll run out of Pfizer and we will switch to Oxford. Uh, once it's licensed. Um, so that it was simply a matter of time. Um, second question was um, about the, the role of other vaccines such as MMR and uh, Dr. Chowdhury mentioned BCG in protection. This is actually very, very interesting to me um, in my research, even pre-COVID. Um, so when you give people a live vaccine like BCG or MMR, it does seem to be a, a non-specific immune stimulant. So um, th there's some scientific plausibility that it generally boosts your immune system to get these vaccines. Um, I think any impact of these vaccines is, might be at an epidemiological level rather than an individual benefit. Um, but there are people doing research on this. I, I'm not very convinced by the MMR data, actually. I'm more convinced by the BCG data. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Susie. Uh, so now uh, we Abhi, will uh, Abhi, move to. Abhi, I have a question. Uh, oh, sir, please. Question. Please, sir, go ahead. Uh, uh, Professor Susana, you have a very nice presentation. I have a simple query that in our uh, survey in the Dhaka slum area, they have uh, they have not mass attack with this uh, this COVID nineteen, and their antibody usually uh, is high. Uh, what do you think, even the rickshaw pullers and the day laborers, they are not suffering much with this COVID-19. Whether any uh, immunity or any, uh, that is the body immunity plays a role in, in, in this situation. What, what is your comment? Thank you. I'm very interested to hear this. May I clarify, do you mean that in the community you're studying, you're finding very high rates of antibodies, even though there wasn't? a lot of illness. Is, is that correct? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. so very, very interesting to me. Um, I have a similar story from a colleague in South Africa who was working in Cape Town and saw a lot of bad COVID. And then he went out to a rural area and he detected a lot of PCR positivity and a lot of antibody positivity, but really mild disease, even in the over 80s. I wonder if some, if your population is a a poorer population um, where they are thin uh, with low rates of ischemic heart disease and diabetes. Would you say that is true or not? Yeah, I think in slum area, Dhaka mm -hmm. is, the population is quite younger. This is true. And I mean, second I, I, thing, I, sorry. comorbidities are low in the slum areas low. compared to yeah. the... In, I mean, I think this uh, is really a world epidemic of um, people who are overweight, diabetic, ischemic heart disease. And in America and the UK, that's now the poorest people. Um, but in countries like South Africa and Bangladesh, um, you know, the, the emerging economies, you, you have quite a lot of these problems in your urban population who are maybe middle class, relatively well off, but in the very poor, they're still uh, they have very high rates of physical activity, for example. Um, they may be thinner, but I'm, yeah. I'm speculating here. You will be more expert than me, and I'm very interested to look into this further. One, one thing may be they are more exposed to the sunlight and they are probably synthesizing more yeah. vitamin D, whether this has a protective role in this situation. I, I'm very, very interested in this. The other cruel thing to say, of course, is that in very, very poor communities in the world, if you're the sort of poor host who doesn't cope well with this virus, you, you, you survive. Something else has already taken you out. So you need a certain wealth um, in order to keep people who are older and frail alive. Um, and that that's a bit of a cruel thing to say, but 
Uh, we think that might be true in some of sub-Saharan Africa, for example, that people don't get to live to old age or, or live with a lot of comorbidities. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Uh, I can't resist myself to take the last questions. Uh, uh, it's uh, from Chittagong. Uh, how far the vaccine vector or vector-based vaccine is uh, important determining the immune response? Yeah, I mean, it's really important. And I could talk all day about this um, and probably bore you, but it, it's the essence of vaccinology. If, if you just injected people with spike protein, it, it wouldn't be packaged right. You wouldn't get enough immune response. Um, the body is actually quite good at ignoring stuff it gets bombarded with. Otherwise, we would all be overreacting to everything. So the thing about vaccinology is you have to give that spike protein with the correct packaging to wake up the immune system. And you need, first of all, the innate immune system to get excited so that um, the spike protein gets presented uh, the antigen presentation to the adaptive immune system is presented correctly so that the body learns to make B cells and T cells. And the thing about um, the Jenner Institute in Oxford is they've spent 30 years researching this and they've finally found that these adenovirus vectors are the best at the right balance. If your vector is too exciting, then people get such horrible side effects from the, the, the vaccine that it's a problem. So you need that right balance um, it's very, very interesting. And the adenoviruses just seem to be particularly good at that balance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susie, for your uh, patience and answering so many questions. Uh, is, uh, is, does Professor Sarnik White manage to join with us? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, let me rename you. And Oh, thank you. Hi. Hi, Susie. So uh, let me introduce, it's, it's an honor for me to introduce uh, Professor Nick with all of you. He is currently the chair of Welcome Trust Southeast Asian Research Institute. Uh, he's the professor of tropical medicine and global health, University of Oxford in the Mahijol University, Thailand. He is actually the global authority of uh, malaria research. It's his primary area of interest, particularly the pathogenesis and treatment of severe malaria, antimicrobial resistance, and other tropical diseases. He, he received knighthood in 2017. I can still remember that, that day when I was in Oxford and we were uh, celebrating uh, Nick's achievement. She, he also received uh, uh, other notable awards like Gallen Medal, Prince Mahidol Prize Fellowship for British Pharmaceutical Society, Manson Medals, and so on. It's an honor and privilege uh, to get uh, Sir Nick with us. And uh, Nick, uh, we are, uh, I mean, we are very happy to get you and you took a lot of uh, effort to travel and then join with us here. So Sir Nick, please, uh, please, uh, it will be, I will be delighted to have your presentation. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, first, I'd like to apologize for disrupting your schedule. I'm afraid the plane from the Burmese border got delayed, as it often does. Uh, but it's a great honor and a privilege and a pleasure to, to talk with you today. Um, I'm, going to, I, I'm, sure, I'm trying to share the screen. I don't know if you can see it. Yes, we can okay. see it. Excellent. Uh, so um, I'm also very grateful to Susie, who's given a really splendid talk uh, and this is the undergraduate version hers was the postgraduate version so she has given you the expert side of the immunology and the virology so my talk is rather sort of high level if you like but superficial uh, it's a general overview of COVID-19 and what uh, much of you well it, it's a remarkable uh, uh, in many ways. I mean, it's been a year like no other, as everyone says, but it's also remarkable in that we all started with exactly the same base of information, i.e. nothing at the beginning of the year. And we've all uh, absorbed information. And I think somebody wisely said an infodemic, which has been difficult to digest with information being bombarded from all sorts of uh, places. And the more conventional ways in which we get information as uh, physicians and scientists, medical practitioners, 
really have been overtaken by uh, premature releases, press releases, uh, tweets, uh, uh, preprints, and so on. So it's this is a perspective of uh, our current situation, and with a with an eye on or from, should I say, low resource settings. And now I'm going to try and move the page, which it won't. Okay, so um, here are a few of the places uh, who haven't reported uh, COVID-19. So uh, none yet from Antarctica, um, none yet from Tonga, interestingly, uh, none from North Korea, but as North Korea is surrounded by two countries with lots, I think that's more a reporting problem. Uh, and as many of you know, the best way to reduce the incidence of a disease is just not to report it. And strangely enough, Turkmenistan, but the point of this simple uh, pro, uh, slide is to say that really this is truly a pandemic. It's gone absolutely everywhere. Um, and this is the evolution of the, of the pandemic. We're, we're going to start in March uh, and you can see already uh, the virus had spread from uh, China and had arrived well, first reported in num substantial numbers in Italy. Europe in the blue was quite badly affected then, uh, with very large numbers of cases. But by May, things were appearing to improve in Europe, but starting to kick off in, uh, in South America and had already kicked off quite substantially in the United States. Then uh, in the Northern Hemisphere's summer, it looked like things were settling down, uh, although numbers rose uh, quite alarmingly in South America, notably in Brazil. Uh, but as we all know, we have a second wave or even perhaps a third wave. Indian cases started to or gradually uh, expanded in the second, uh, third quarter of this year. And now we really have enormous numbers uh, again in, in Europe and in the United States. So that's changed the way that the proportions with Europe dominating now and Europe uh, dominating again. And for those, if you prefer uh, a map, this is the uh, current picture uh, in proportion to size. So actually China has got away with it, if you like, uh, rather, rather lightly, uh, whereas your neighbor India has a substantial number of cases, as does Bangladesh. There's a remarkably linear uh, relationship between uh, mortality risk and age. Um, it's uh, it can, it, because uh, one of the unfortunate facts, which I'm becoming increasingly aware of, which is that the older you are, the more likely you are to die. So effectively, there's an, a fixed increment in risk proportional to age. Uh, the men have slightly worse than the women until the mid uh, 80s. On average, statistically, uh, getting COVID loses you a year, a year of your life. That's just obviously if you get that, that's just an overall statistical assessment of the proportional reduction. Now, from a from a uh, from a perspective of a physician, uh, what can we do? Well, uh, we'll do the vaccine second, and of course, the public health aspect is most important. But from the physician perspective, is there anything we can do to prevent or treat it? So initially, as soon as it was realized that COVID-19 was really going to be a global threat. There was an enormous uh, uh, consideration of what might be used that was currently available, so-called repurposing of drugs, because it was going to take, well, it would definitely take year or years for new chemical entities to pass through, you know, to be developed and go through the even accelerated uh, clinical development stage. So. What might there be that could or would already work? And the number of drugs, all of these familiar with you, to you, uh, have been evaluated, and this is only part of them. 
there have there's been a proliferation of uh, very of small, often observational trials, um, and unfortunately, a paucity of large, definitive, randomized control trials that have provided useful, actionable intelligence. Uh, and I'm afraid this does reflect a failure to coordinate the global research effort. Still, let's go back to the beginning of the year. Uh, and uh, one of the first observations was that uh, chloroquine has, and, and its uh, hydroxylated uh, brother or sister, hydroxychloroquine, have really broad spectrum uh, but relatively weak antiviral effects. They affect coronaviruses. Uh, they'd been they'd been looked at quite uh, in quite some detail in laboratory models with, with the first SARS, SARS the original SARS virus. Uh, it works on other coronaviruses. Works on some flaviviruses. So perhaps chloroquine could work because chloroquine is very cheap. Um, really. Uh, from a from a malaria perspective, we know that you can treat malaria with less than 10 US cents worth of chloroquine. So this was deployable. And then, as many of you know, we had a claim, uh, a really quite excessive claim from uh, France, from uh, Didier Raoult's group in, in Marseille, that hydroxychloroquine combined with azithromycin uh, resulted in accelerated uh, SARS-CoV-2 viral clearance. And that was picked up by the uh, news media and really uh, distorted almost everything ever since. Uh, it became adopted by the US president noisily. It be, uh, was also adopted by the Brazilian president. The French president made uh, had some warm words for this very important research and uh, views became very rapidly polarized. The evidence was weak. In the US, if you were a Republican, you were for hydroxychloroquine. If you were a Democrat, you were against it. There were a number of other drugs though that were under consideration, a number of more conventional uh, antivirals, the antiretrovirals, lopinavir, lopinavir, retinavir being most widely available, but several other anti-HIV uh, anti drugs have uh, significant ex vivo activity, and so do some of the hepatitis C drugs. Uh, nitrosoxanide, a very interesting um, antiprotozole, has reasonable ex vivo activity, as does the antihelmintic niclosamide. All of these have been under consideration. And then at the other end of the spectrum were, uh, was a, were evaluation of what we might say immunomodulators. And Susie has already mentioned the concept of just non-specific boosting of the immune system, stimulation of the phagocytes, as George Bernard Shaw might say. And if the distortion wasn't bad, it became a lot worse uh, in May. In fact, on May the 22nd, uh, by this time, we had had an emergency use authorization from the United States Food and Drug Authority for hydroxychloroquine, and then we had a reversal of that position. Both of these were rather hurried. Uh, and then this paper came out in The Lancet, which claimed to have data from nearly 100,000 patients all over the world and showing that hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine, both were associated with uh, a significant risk of ventricular arrhythmias and sudden death. Now, it's, been, it's well known that chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine prolong the electrocardiograph QT interval, and therefore there is a potential uh, risk or, or increased risk, should I say, of torsade de point, which is a uh, polymorphic ventricular tachyarrhythmia associated with sudden death. But actually the data to support that risk were not there. In fact, there's a huge amount of data from the use of these drugs for over the past 70 years to say in fact that they are not associated with a significant this significant risk but this was trumped apology for the pun by this uh, paper which was very soon retracted because it was pretty clear uh, uh, with almost with not very much detailed investigation that this was fabricated and so the lancet 
retracted, but the damage was enormous. Um, regulatory authorities withdrew uh, their authorization. They stopped the trials. They stopped, uh, we were running a very large trial uh, of hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis, which was stopped. The French stopped all their trials. And, the, and this damage was not reversed when it was realized that this paper was fabricated. And then shortly after that, we, we had the results of the two, really the two large randomized controlled platform trials. Uh, the first to report was the UK's recovery trial, and they reported on the hydroxychloroquine arm and showed very clearly that in hospitalized patients, uh, that hydroxychloroquine was not at, at a dose that was as, as high as, uh, as would be safe. Uh, was not associated with a reduction in mortality. In fact, I'll show you those survival curves in a minute. And the solidarity trial, which used exactly the same dose, um, which is a multinational platform trial, had effectively the same result. So that made it very clear that hydroxychloroquine in hospitalized patients uh, was not beneficial. Indeed, there was a slight increase in mortality um, in the hydroxychloroquine groups. But that occurred, interestingly, quite after the, the survival curves diverge after the end of treatment. So this is unlikely to represent drug toxicity, which was the main concern at the time. And these trials did confirm that, uh, the, uh, with reasonable numbers, um, well, large numbers, that uh, there was no increased risk of cardiac arrhythmia, which had been the main concern with this class of drugs. But the unfortunate finding was in severe patients, it didn't work. I'm going to come back to that slide. Let me just uh, uh, present some of the other ones which also didn't work. Now, uh, lopinavir, ritinavir, uh, it had been hoped would work because it's an antiretroviral, which is generally uh, available and affordable, but that also uh, was shown in the recovery trial not to work. A uh, lot of hope for remdesivir based on this early uh, report from China published in the Lancet, but the solidarity trial uh, showed that there was no significant reduction um, in mortality, much to the manufacturer ch uh, chagrin. Manu this is made by, by Gilead. Um, in fact, none of the conventional antivirals uh, have worked in terms of reduced mortality in the large uh, randomized controlled trials. And the data on surrogate markers, such as viral clearance, which really means the rate of uh, reduction of QPCR, i.e. quantitated uh, viral nucleic acid in the nasopharynx or oropharynx, the, they, the data on that are not convincing for any um, antiviral. The only things where there really is quite good evidence that they accelerate viral clearance are monoclonal antibodies. And you may have seen the, there are two in the lead. There's the Eli Lilly, uh, monoclonal, which they won't say what it is. And then there's the Regeneron, which are two monoclonals. Trump got Regeneron, a uh, paper published in the New England Journal yesterday, really showing quite substantial acceleration of viral clearance. But the problem is these are effectively unaffordable in low resource settings. It's, but it does look promising for this therapeutic approach. And it is hoped very much that there would be affordable, deployable, low-cost monoclonals, but they won't be in the next few months and possibly within a year. So what does work? The only thing that's really clearly works is dexamethasone. At what's called a low dose, so six milligrams a day for adults, um, and that 
uh, was, was shown in the recovery trial and again in the uh, supported in the solidarity trial, that does reduce mortality. It reduces mortality uh, in people who are receiving respiratory support. So that's uh, either oxygen or mechanical ventilation. And this is good because it is uh, inexpensive. It did not work. In fact, if anything, it points to harm in people who were not receiving respiratory support. And that's shown here. So if you look at, there are four, uh, four survival curves. Uh, we've got the overall one in the top left. Um, and then we have the different groups. And uh, you can see that in the no oxygen received group, which is the bottom right, where there's the yellow arrow, that uh, if anything, the direct, well, the direction of, is in the direction of harm with a, a rate ratio of uh, 1.19 and the 95% confidence interval does cross one. So this is not significant at the 5% level, it's actually significant at the 10% level, but it, it does raise the possibility, uh, which I would like to come back to, that um, that we should not be using steroids in a mild disease. And altogether, uh, I think it supports that and many other things support a rather simple paradigm, which is that uh, you get you exposed to the virus and many people don't even know they're ill. Uh, those who are going to be ill, that the viral uh, burden peaks around that time, and then it declines. And uh, what a, a crudely might be called inflammatory response dominates in that small proportion of patients who are, uh, who become sick and require admission to hospital. And that in, those, in that context, steroid, corticosteroids are beneficial. The IL-6 in inhibitor, by the way, didn't work. Um, I'm just going to flick quickly back to that uh, slide, which got out of place. Um, so th there's been a lot of con uh, interest in perhaps saying, well, you know, steroids work in severe illness. What about mild illness? And I showed you that a caution and the uh, intensive care community have warned against use of steroids in mild disease, but there are people who are trying to evaluate them. There is some evidence uh, for harm. Uh, we know from our basic pathology that um, immunomodulators in general interfere with our host defense against viruses and giving, and people who are on steroids are more vulnerable uh, to viral infections. We know that, for example, in both uh, uh, seasonal and um, pandemic influenza in hospitalized people with pneumonia, that steroids make that worse. And there's some evidence uh, in COVID that people already taking steroids, in this case for inflammatory bowel disease, uh, do worse. The other big group on, on steroids are asthmatics, but there we are, we are confounded by, because this is a pneumonic illness. So interpretation of those data are more difficult. For what it's worth, people on inhaled steroids uh, who with asthmatics who on inhaled steroids do not do worse. So, so if that if that paradigm is correct, uh, then perhaps antiviral drugs are going to have their best chance of working in mild disease early when the viral burden is highest, and then unlikely to work late. Uh, when the viral burden has come down anyway and inflammatory responses predominate. And if you look at the mild end of the spectrum with hydroxychloroquine, you do see a not significant overall uh, benefit with uh, hydroxychloroquine in post-exposure prophylaxis, which is effectively an early form of treatment. These are trials where uh, people who, are ex who were uh, either first degree relatives or shared a house with, uh, with COVID-19 infected, people who were ill with COVID-19, that they were given immediately hydroxychloroquine. So maybe it does have some benefit there. Maybe it works 
in pre-exposure prophylaxis, but it has become increasingly difficult to conduct these studies because of the toxic milieu. There's so much pressure now, and I'll show you that that pressure has just ramped up in the last 24 hours against these drugs. Let's not forget a few other things that are very important for the hospitalized patients, but affordable. Uh, we know that uh, COVID-19 in the hospitalized patients is a pro-coagulant state, and therefore we have to be very vigilant in uh, our use of uh, prophylactic anticoagulation uh, and watch out for deterioration as this could have, this could, you know, breath, worsening, worsening breathlessness doesn't necessarily mean progression of the viral pneumonia. It might mean pulmonary emboli. Oxygen is an important uh, and precious commodity, and we've already seen um, that in some situations, in, for example, parts of India have run out of oxygen, uh, and there's been disappointingly little research on the appropriate use of oxygen, although experience is suggesting that, uh, that the state of happy hypoxia in other words, people who are relatively hypoxic, but not troubled by it, uh, is not harmful, but it needs to be very carefully monitored. So we need, I think we do need more research on the simple use and indications for oxygen when oxygen is limited in its availability. So this is the um, guidance we had on steroids uh, in September from WHO which was basically use, um, use dexamethasone or its corticosteroid equivalent, prednisolone, prednisone, methylprednisolone, or hydrocortisone uh, in people who require oxygen support or, or require ventilation, but don't use it in non-severe COVID. And in the last 24 hours, this recommendation hasn't gone live yet, but it's dated yesterday. So I think it will go live very soon. And that is that reiterates this um, support for steroids in severe illness, support uh, 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 caution against steroids in mild illness, uh, a conditional recommendation against remdesivir because it didn't work in the solidarity trial, and um, it's uh, it's telling you not now to use uh, hydroxychloroquine and lopinavir, ritinavir. It doesn't say. Uh, whether the whether trials should discontinue, but it's going to make continuation of the trials extremely difficult. And this is a pity because these uh, this uh, living guideline is based on evidence that you and I can uh, read. It's not based on any uh, trials that they have access to their information, and we don't. And we know that this is a summary recommendation where they have pooled data all the way from the mildest disease to the most severe. And I think that's incorrect and inappropriate. One of the problems we have um, is how do you choose drugs? Uh, there is not a, an agreed methodology for analyzing therapeutic responses. Uh, Probably the best measure is a rate of reduction in the viral uh, load in adjusted, uh, probably adjusted by, uh, by uh, extracellular fluid concentrations of urea uh, concentration in the nasopharynx or oropharynx. But that's not actually what is done. People are reporting time to clearance, which is a very imprecise measure. They're using one or two samples so many of the, much of the literature is confused. And the result of this is it's, we really don't know whether anything works with probably the best evidence for the monoclonal antibodies provided, uh, well, with a few provisos because assessing a monoclonal antibody uh, and assessing an antiviral in this way have slightly different interpretations, but this has been an impediment to our screening of potentially available drugs in that list I showed you at the beginning. Uh, I, I, you discussed this already, and it, I think it is important. Um, in general, I think in East Asia, there is this is not so much of a problem, but as, as Susie and the discussants point out, there are some countries where 
uh, rumors and adverse publicity and so forth are really taken over. Parts of Africa believe that, uh, that this is a conspiracy to um, inoculate people with microchips. The two th a third of the American population doesn't want to have vaccine, et cetera, et cetera. So um, one really important, I think, and practical thing that we could do right now is to do the social science research necessary to, to try to find out how we can best inform the public as these vaccines do eventually become uh, generally available. And how can we preempt rumors and uh, completely fabricated uh, claims which could derail the uh, responsible and appropriate deployment of vaccines. We've seen this happen before uh, in countries. We've seen it damage polio campaigns. So uh, this is something that would be relatively inexpensive and should be done, I think, now. The vaccines, as you know, and I'm coming on to that, uh, are not going to be available next week, but they are coming. And we need to make sure that they are appropriately accepted because the deployment is going to be an unusual one, as Susie has explained. We're going to be humanizing old people, uh, whereas all our strategies and campaigns and uh, previous vaccines have been directed towards children. And, and we need society to accept the, uh, th this approach and to understand it. Simple things, uh, not enough research, interestingly, uh, and, some, and some rubbish research saying that face masks don't do anything, but we know that face masks do protect you, they do protect uh, others, although quantitating that has been a challenge, and we know that social distancing is very important. It's been, Thailand has done a remarkable job, this is where I'm talking to you from now, and this is there, you can't read it, but it's effectively advising people uh, about how they should socially distance. And there, there has been quite good uptake of uh, the recommendations to wear uh, uh, face masks, not to congregate in large close groups, particularly indoors and to respect social distancing. So these simple things are important. And then the discussion you've just had. So the, the question for low resource settings is when are they going to get a vaccine? And I think the first thing to say, at least according to Marie-Paul Kearney, who is uh, on just about every global committee on vaccines, her view is that there will not be sufficient vaccine deployment, or first of all, availability and deployment uh, for at least a year and probably even perhaps up to two to provide herd immunity. That's really important. So ultimately that's what we want. Uh, we want, we want uh, there to be sufficient uh, immunity in the population such that the virus cannot uh, have an R not more than one. In other words, can't spread effectively. Um, and that, that may happen through natural infection as you've just discussed, but it's not gonna happen through the vaccine because there just isn't enough vaccine. And, and the vaccine production capabilities have been slightly exaggerated. And you've seen that there already are, are well, there's clear evidence that the distribution is not going to be equitable. Sorry. Very quickly, uh, this is a primer for, just to say that uh, just about every possible permutation of vaccine is under development by somebody or other. Um, and there are many, many vaccines in the pipeline, but there are only a relatively few at the front, which you've been discussing. So for example, the um, chimpanzee adenovirus, which Ox the Oxford uh, group uh, uh, developed or marketed by Zeneca, uh, they've inserted the coronavirus spike gene in that. The Sputnik um, Russian vaccine is a, is a human adenovirus with, again, with a spike gene uh, inserted. Uh, the very interesting front runners um, have been the mRNA vaccines. They're front runners because it's much more, it's quicker to develop an mRNA vaccine than any other type of vaccine. But there hadn't been an mRNA vaccine in humans before. And I, I strongly suspect that if we hadn't had COVID, it would be quite a few years and uh, there would have been a lot more caution about uh, their introduction in, and deployment as, a human, as human vaccines, but they have been very effective. In fact, I would say that 
uh, everything we've seen so far from vaccines has exceeded expectations, which is a very nice place to be. I think therapeutics has uh, failed us and it's been worse than we expected, but the vaccines have been better. And you know that the mRNA, the two lead mRNA vaccines have, uh, have claimed to have more than 90% protection. It's claimed because none of these things, none of the mRNA vaccine data have actually been or on efficacy has been published yet, whereas we have now had at least got some data published in a peer reviewed journal from the, the Oxford vaccine. And there are other var var uh, variants too, such as protein subunits and virus like particles. But there are a whole slew of vaccines uh, and they're, they're going through an accelerated development. It, it usually takes 10 to 15 years to develop a vaccine, and these ones have, coming out, have come out within a year. So it is, it's a remarkable uh, tribute to the, the vaccine developers. Um, one of the problems with the mRNA vaccines is the one we just discussed, is there's not enough of them. They're very expensive. Uh, and particularly for the Pfizer vaccine, uh, the requirement uh, is to store them at at least minus 70 or probably minus 80. The, the, the RNA is suspended in little lipid droplets. And these are, these are quite, the whole RNA itself is very unstable and the, the formulation is quite heat sensitive. The other problem apparently is that they uh, are deployed in large batches. So you have operationally have to uh, have a lot of people ready to be immunized at once and they all require two doses as you know and uh, the chief executive of Pfizer did very well out of it so this is big money and i strongly suspect Pfizer and Moderna are going to make big money but uh, this i just don't think is the right thing for low resource settings i really don't see that uh, low resource settings should be buying uh, huge numbers of freezers and uh, developing a completely new cold for mRNA vaccines. It'd be much better to use vaccines which can be put in the refrigerator like most other vaccines. This is the uh, Sputnik vaccine, uh, which was, uh, you know, again, published by press release. Uh, interestingly, they said it was 92% effective but my calculation means that they had 18.5 people in one group and 1.5 in the other, which strongly suggests that the randomization was unequal. Uh, I strongly suspect it does work very well, however. And uh, as you've probably read in the news, there's some plans to actually even combine these two, the two adenovirus vaccines. The Moderna vaccine, probably just as good as the, um, as the Pfizer vaccine, but appears to be a little more heat stable, but still requires minus 20, apparently. And those were the numbers. Uh, one of the nice things uh, about the um, press releases is they often give you the actual numbers, so you can do the stats yourself. That's a list of the, of the front runners. Um, actually, probably Sanofi and GSK at the bottom are not a front runner. They are probably a year behind everyone else and probably won't have their vaccine out. Uh, they said June 2021, but they've just pushed that back to the end of, of next year. So the, I, obviously from a low resource setting uh, perspective, there, there's a lot to say in favor of the um, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. It's been uh, produced effectively at more or less cost price. It, uh, it's still $4 dose, but that's... that's uh, that's in the line with other vaccines, um, whereas the other ones at the moment are rather expensive, although the Sputnik vaccine is not too expensive. This is Hafkin uh, immunizing uh, with the plague vaccine uh, over, uh, over 100 years ago. Uh, and it, it's that sort of organization that is going to be needed uh, if the vaccine deployment is going to, is going to be done properly. Um, as you know, uh, and Susie probably has much more information uh, than I do about this, uh, the Oxford vaccine was interesting in that um, the higher dose produced lower efficacy. And this is, uh, and through some interesting uh, interaction between the, uh, the manufacturer or who, who scaled up the manufacturing 
and the assay of virus in the vaccine led to a, uh, a lower dose being used in some of the studies, which gave 90% protection compared to uh, 62.1 in the first part. So um, I don't understand the immunology there, but maybe Susie does. And let's hope that uh, it, it is closer to 90, but even 62.1 at scale would be very, very valuable. Last a couple of slides. Um, so just to say that uh, I think we, we really had a limited transparency on decision making in COVID-19 at all levels. Um, these are the big players, you know them all. They are, uh, they are responsible for the development of the vaccines, diagnostics and therapeutics, or for supporting the development, I should say. But it's not uh, very clear what decisions they make, uh, why they make them, or how they make them. Um, and I think it would be, particularly from a low resource setting perspective, important that there was a greater say uh, from the uh, large populations who are not really having sufficient voice at the uh, table. Uh, we uh, we hear a lot of good words, but we don't hear the precise details. And I think many people would be uh, would not be unreasonable to be suspicious uh, when you don't hear what's going on and you do see um, the wealthier countries getting the uh, first, second and third uh, place at the table. Uh, so the COVID-19 Clinical Research Coalition is uh, a representing the resource settings to try and get more of a say in how these uh, decisions are made, hopefully with the objective of a, a, a more equitable distribution of interventions of all sorts. That would be diagnostics, which I haven't talked about very much, I haven't talked about at all actually, um, and very important component of, of public health, but also any therapeutics that worked and particularly vaccine uh, deployment. Sorry. So um, it's been a, this is my last slide, it's been a really tough year for everyone. Uh, uh, it, the world will not be the same since, uh, afterwards. Uh, many things have fundamentally changed forever, but we must uh, relax just because there is uh, a vaccine that is available just in the last few weeks. As, as you discussed before, we don't know how effective it will be. We know it's not going to be generally widely deployed, but certainly not to low resource settings in the near future. Uh, and as I said, it's unlikely that uh, we will be able to get herd immunity uh, within a year or two at best uh, with these vaccines. So that means that the, for the moment, we're, the use of the vaccine is to protect people uh, from Ill, vulnerable groups from illness. Um, and we are going to see COVID uh, for at least a year or two, if not longer. And that's provided that COVID behaves itself and uh, doesn't uh, mutate. I don't think this is as, as, as big a concern, but interested to hear what others think and doesn't you know we don't get best vaccine escape mutants uh, if are we going to go to therapeutic i think it's still uh, relatively unlikely none of the it was always unlikely that any that a repurposed drug would be very effective uh, at best a therapeutics are likely to provide small benefits and one of the unfortunate things as i said earlier is that there have not been large definitive randomized control trials, for example, in prophylaxis. Uh, and there have been only a few in treatment. And we really needed less small uh, observational studies and more uh, coordinated multinational uh, trials, which gave, defini gave definitive results. I don't think we will have a brilliant therapeutic. We might have a partially effective one. And eventually, we'll get a vaccine. So thank you very much for your attention. Happy to entertain any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Sarnik. 
Uh, again, I have uh, piles of question on my personal chat box, but I would like to pick just a couple of them. One question is, uh, Nick, is it possible to uh, on your video? I mean, we'll be very happy to see you. Now the room is dark. Can you see me? Uh, oh, yes, you can. Yes, yeah. I'll put the light on so you can see me. It's gone dark since I started talking. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I will just pick a couple of questions from the attendees. One question is, what is the best time to introduce corticosteroid? Is it harmful to give steroid in the early phase of early course of illness? Well, I, I think that's a really good question to which I don't have a clear answer. I would say that it's absolutely indicated if people require supplemental oxygen in hospital. So if they're hypoxic on, an, on a emitter, they need steroids. I don't think you should give steroids otherwise. That's my personal view. There need to be really good randomized trials in mild disease. But I certainly, the moment the WHO recommendation is not to give it until people require oxygen supplements. Thank you. The second uh, question I'd like to ask you that we noticed lots of erratic use of antibiotics, third generation fluoroquinolones and other uh, high profile antibiotics in case of COVID, although it's a viral infection. So uh, what is your uh, comments on this? And it, can it be an issue for a country like us where uh, there is always a potential chance of booming of tuberculosis? Another good question. Yes, I think the indications for antibiotics in the hospitalized patient are no different to any other uh, person who is admitted with a viral pneumonia. So they're not, uh, you should, there's no indication to give them empirically. You have to have clear evidence of a nosocomial pneumonia. One thing I would like to add is that azithromycin uh, is not beneficial, but does have a uh, does potentiate the QT prolongation associated with hydroxychloroquine, and that is potentially dangerous. So I, I would not, uh, if somebody happens to be on chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, don't use azithromycin. Otherwise, uh, as ever, uh, that difficult decision as to whether you think there's a nosocomial superinfection, but they should not be given empirically. Thank you. One question I'm going to take from the panelist. It's Professor Robert's question. Sir, do you want to ask that directly? I mean, yes, yes, yes. Please. Uh, Professor Nick, thank you very much. It was a fantastic presentation. But uh, I would like to ask a few things. One thing is that you've been uh, busy about the COP call study. We'd like to know something about that one. And second thing, can you please tell me what is going on with Ramzosevid? I mean, uh, there are some groups who is actually showing that it could be given, that authorization has been given by the FDA while there's a conditional uh, statement from the WHO. I mean, why there is a conditional? And secondly, you will see that in the last day, there's another paper came up, where there's a combo of the remdesivir and baricitinib has been found to be effective in the severe diseases who needs oxygen. So what's your opinion? Right, so um, Kopkov is struggling along. It's, it's, uh, going now in uh, in Pakistan, in Thailand, in it's just about to start in Indonesia, in uh, in the UK, uh, it should start in Niger and Kenya very soon, and Guatemala. Uh, but we are definitely not going to get the very large numbers of pay, of uh, people enrolled that we thought because it's been really hard to recruit, uh, particularly in, um, as, as a result of these rumors, and subsequently in the UK where we were running the trial, the vaccine has effectively stopped it. So we, we, we don't want to do, this is a, this, I, if at best hydroxychloroquine might uh, have a modest reduction in the risk, uh, but once the vaccine arrives with these sort of vaccine efficacies, you wouldn't want to use it. Oh, remdesivir, well, uh, you know, plowing through the evidence on anything in COVID is, is quite, um, it's entertaining if, you've got, if you're a patient, and if you're impatient, it's very frustrating. I would say remdesivir, uh, like any 
direct acting anti antiviral has got its best chance of working early, but it's a parenteral drug and it's expensive. So uh, the question is, does it work in the milder end of disease? I think the solidarity trial tells you it probably doesn't work at the severe end, but uh, for almost everything, there are, tri there, are, there are trials for and trials against. So I don't know which, I can't uh, remember the trial you just referred to, but if it's one or 200 patients, I would not take too much notice. If it's a few thousand, I would. Uh, we need trials with thousands of people, which are well-conducted randomized trials. But, but I, I suspect remdesivir does have some effect, but it's just, if we had a proper phase two methodology where we could look at where people do, analyze properly instead of incorrectly viral clearance rates, then we would, then if there was an acceleration in viral clearance, then I think you, it would be very reasonable to assume it had benefit. If it did not accelerate viral clearance, it's highly unlikely to work. But beware of those viral clearance uh, papers. There's a whole slew of them in the last couple of months. You have to uh, look at the starting viral uh, qPCR and then interpret the time to clearance. It's a bit like a, uh, a malaria parasite clearance time. The higher the malaria parasitemia, the longer it takes to clear, obvious. The higher you are, the longer it takes you to hit the ground. So uh, look at those with some, with some skepticism, uh, but I, I, I think it might work, it, it might work. We'll see. Thank you, Professor Robert. The last question I will take from the uh, attendees because uh, our time is running out. Should we advise people uh, taking COVID vaccine who already experienced the infection, especially in the background where antibody testing is not available? So the question is, should we... Should uh, we advise people uh, to take vaccine? Yes. Who already experienced COVID-19 infection ah, in Susie the background where online. antibody testing is not available? Susie, I'm going to pass that one skillfully <laughs> on to Susie. Over to you, Susie. So should we take vaccine, even if, if testing not? Uh, if you already uh, have the infection. I personally don't think you should be prioritised as a group at the moment, um, because current data suggests your protection is still present at six months or so. We need more data in time to work out how long protection lasts. Um, I think personally, if I was offered a vaccine and I'd already had it, I would take the vaccine, yes, um, just because I think the vaccine's very safe. I don't think that will do me any harm, but I don't think I ought to be a priority. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Thanks. Hello, I, want, uh, I have a yes. question to Mike. Yes, please. Uh, hello, uh, Professor uh, Nick White. Um, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. I have a small question. That is, what about the ivermectin? In our ah. country, there is a randomized trial uh, conducted by the ICD-DRB. They have shown that ivermectin is effective uh, in mild COVID infection. What is your opinion regarding this issue? Use of ivermectin in mild yeah. COVID. Okay, so uh, the same stable that produced the fabricated data on hydroxychloroquine also produced a fabricated, probably, paper on ivermectin had huge implications. Ivermectin has been widely used, particularly in South America. I personally don't think there is any convincing evidence. There are always papers saying that, every, that something works. But as I said before, are they large, definitive, randomized, controlled trials? And if they're not, then I'm afraid I would say, we need those before we have an opinion. My opinion, it doesn't work. That's my opinion. Uh, uh, it's like many well, drugs, it you. has thank certainly you. got activity in, uh, in the laboratory, um, and it's been evaluated in a number of viral infections, including uh, dengue, for example. Uh, but I, I don't think, uh, I, I've seen the data, uh, the preliminary data, and it is not sufficiently convincing. We need a several thousand people, care, well randomized, to know whether it really works or not. Dr. Rabbi, may I ask one question to yes, Professor Yes, sir, Nick? please, please, sir. Pro Professor Sanik, may I ask one question to you? 
professor neek yes uh, you have shown in one slide the bearable aspects of defined patients you know in young persons they the when the disease is acquired in young persons it is uh, just like flu so, and the mortality in older persons is gradually increasing that's why the in young persons they are reluctant to get vaccines whether the immunity after infection and after vaccination would going to be same what is your uh, opinion well again susie is much better to answer that but we wouldn't prioritize young people at the moment uh, i mean even in the uk who theoretically bought more vaccine than they need the young people aren't getting it right now uh, so uh, you're right it's a mild i mean the trouble covid isn't innocuous at any age i mean we've seen these unpleasant kawasaki like syndromes in children you can get sick at any age but you wouldn't be a prior your chance your probability of getting sick is really low so i don't see young people getting vaccinated really for quite a long time i don't know if susie wants to comment on that hello yes i mean this is where we need our modelers um but i agree with sir nick white that uh, they're just not a priority the young group and i think in the uk it's been slightly cynical that what makes the headlines is the, the deaths, so the, the priority is very, very elderly people living in care homes, many of whom have advanced dementia and very short life expectancy anyway, but they won't die of COVID now with the vaccine, they'll die of something else. And there's a health economics argument that we should be looking at uh, getting the vaccine into people like, my daughter has a teacher with a chronic lung condition called cystic fibrosis and uh, she's in her 40s and she is un unable to go to work as a teacher because she's shielding. And so I think someone like her should be a priority, um, but it's, it's a complex decision-making for a society. How do you ration uh, a limited resource like a vaccine? And the young people vaccinating them as, as we vaccinate young people for flu, can have a role in reducing transmission to vulnerable people, but I think we're a long way off that. There's a calculator released today on the UK, where if you're in the UK, you can calculate when you're gonna get a vaccine. And my sister in her 50s uh, got a date of June 2020. So I think if you're 19, it's, it's gonna be never at the moment. Thank you. So uh, I have. Is there a time for a, another question? Yes, Professor Lanaruddha. This would be the last question. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Sir Nick White. I'm uh, Dr. Anuruddha from Kitagong, or you better know me as Joy from. Nice to see. You. Nice to hear you. Unmute, Kurinen. I can't. I can't hear the question. Uh, Hopefully yes, you yeah. can hear now. You can hear yes. now. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, I was wondering whether uh, there is uh, what is the role of the hydroxy or chloroquine uh, hydroxychloroquine's potential as a pre-exposure prophylaxis? As we have known that uh, it will take time to vaccinate all people, and India is persisting on its stand with uh, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine's. Uh, pre-exposure profile access role and it has now uh, India is now giving all the uh, first line uh, worker including the police and others uh, is putting uh, them on the hydroxychloroquine profile access. I want your opinion. Yes it's a very important question uh, and the only way to answer it is very large randomized trials not small trials which are powered to only show large differences. We don't think it's going to be very effective, but it might be 20 or 30% protective. It might reduce your chance of getting seriously ill. We don't know. It needs large randomized trials. And, uh, but it, it's been very difficult to conduct these, but if Bangladesh would like to join the Kopkov study, we would be delighted. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I apologize to all other participants who put question to my personal chat box. I'm really sorry. We're actually running out of time, but uh, 
but it was fabulous the last two and a half hours. Now I would like to go to the chairs. Uh, first of all, I would like to request Professor M. Uh, Ridwanu Rahman. Uh, Professor Ridwan is a senior uh, internal medicine uh, internist of the country. He's a very popular teacher, currently head of uh, Universal Medical College Research Center, and, uh, and, and, and a very critic and uh, advocate COVID science in, in COVID-19 in Bangladesh. He is also the vice president of uh, our society, Bangladesh Society of Infectious and Tropical Diseases. Sir, please, uh, uh, we will be delighted to hear your comments. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the presenters, and the panelists, and all the audience. It was a wonderful first time for all of us together to listen to some updates. Uh, and uh, solving many issues and questions facing sir your your microphone is uh, dropping sometime uh, i don't know it's, it's open maybe <laughs> Uh, we we can't hear you, sir. Can we read them? Can you hear now? Yes. Yes. So it, it was uh, a wonderful past time for me for all the physicians and I. At some of the many of the confusions uh, arising out of social media information, also affect specialists in my country. So it was uh, the, all the presentations, very time demanding presentations, and uh, they have uh, really pinpointed the purpose of the title. Uh, and the uh, I don't think that the time is so long that I can discuss uh, in long, but in, in short, that Professor Lin has uh, very elaborately explained the role of various diagnostic methods in COVID-19. But unfortunately, in Bangladesh, we cannot test diagnose COVID-19. We can do only up to 20,000 tests a day in a population of 160 million. Uh, and the other tests, which are antigen test, antibody test, and various tests have not been recommended till now, has not been permitted to be used in Bangladesh. Uh, so the Bangladeshi doctors are managing patients based on clinical judgment. And when available, doing PCR, or alternatively in some PCR negative and in other cases with respiratory symptoms, they are also using HRCT and chest X-rays for the diagnosis of the diseases. So uh, we have learned so many diagnostic tests are available in the, in the world, but Bangladesh has none. Uh, the second presentation was an excellent uh, review of the immunology in COVID-19. I think I have been enormously benefited by the way she talked and the information she delivered to all of us. And uh, the uh, questions of uh, immunity, uh, the duration, the, so many of the things are not yet uh, can be concluded, but still uh, there are uh, indications and there are uh, uh, reasons to, 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 to think of some of the uh, uh, immune mechanisms and immune aspects. And uh, through question, the, the reason that Bangladesh is not having, the uh, slums are not having, I think you all got this answer. Uh, and uh, the final one by Professor Nick, very learned uh, professor, and we know him for very long. And uh, as usual, he delivered a very basics uh, of uh, COVID-19, evolution of its management, repurposing of the drugs, and the ways of decision-making, how should we decide? So the, the, that will be the uh, learning for us that uh, we should not uh, run after all the clinical trials published uh, unless the, the size of the population, patient population is large enough in, in thousands rather than in hundreds. So uh, 
we are still uh, the informations are evolving many of the informations we will continue to know and uh, bangladesh is managing uh, covid uh, by putting stones in the dark and uh, we remain there till now if there are any improvement in the near future maybe we will have a better outcome still we, we should rationalize the use of drug we, we should try prevent development of a antiviral antibiotic resistance epidemic uh, after the covid is over we should limit the use of uh, ancillary drugs and which are not effectively recommended uh, by the who and also <clears throat> that we are waiting for the vaccines uh, very unlikely that we are going to get very early unless the oxford vaccine is available so, uh, please, uh, and uh, bangladesh is one of the worst affected it's not known to the world that we are worst affected because of the small number of tests we are doing uh, so, but is 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 worse than india we can say and uh, maybe worse than brazil uh, also so uh in the midst of it fortunately we have a relatively low a relatively low uh, in a situation where we don't know because we are not been allowed to know that the mortality is not that high like that of because of the uh, population who are under age uh, there are not been not many people beyond 70 years and not many people surviving with multiple comorbidities and we still have lots of fatalities around the country uh, uh, which uh, we cannot count so uh, uh, i would like to end here by thanking all the presenters and uh, all the uh, co panelists uh, for inviting me to be here and to thank you very much sir thank you very much thank you very much now i would like to request uh, professor h m nazmul hasan uh, professor hasan is the uh, professor of medicine uh, popular medical college he was the former head of the department of medicine dhaka medical college Uh, past president of bangladesh society of medicine and current governor of uh, ac american college of physician bangladesh chapter uh, professor asan's research area is uh, tuberculosis and other lung disease because i am his direct student and i know his research interests for very long i would like to request sir to uh, to highlight his views on today's session thank you dr abbi for your kind introduction i am thankful to dr this society for asking me to remain chairperson of this wonderful session uh, this covid 19 infection this is a thunderstorm for mankind actually human beings are struggling with this disease this a small unknown virus and unknown disease human beings are struggling to deal with the disease our human body is amazing how the immune system the innate immunity and adaptive immunity deals with different infections this is actually wonderful and people actually at this moment are desperately and eagerly waiting for a vaccine to develop their own immunity against this viral infection professor Su susana or Su professor sudhi sudhi what do you spell i do not know you are spelling always professor sudhi but i thought she is professor susana <coughs> she explained ex excellently the, with the immune human status of our body and how vaccine is going to help and uh, professor liaqat ali he has also shown how different investigations are done and what is the scientific knowledge theoretical knowledge how we can deal with these investigations one thing uh, uh, our there should be a coordination between researchers scientists and uh, clinicians and also national leaders but we have seen that antigen test it has been started with 10 district hospital remote hospitals he has said that it should be started from central to periphery but it had been started from periphery to central so there should be some coordination <coughs> and professor sanik uh, he has uh, said like an professor he has always uh, mentioned that our treatment should be uh, uh, along evidence base uh, at this moment anticoagulants and steroids 
oxygen therapies, these are the main mainstay of treatment. So our treatment should be uh, always rationalized and uh, always randomized and a scientific basis. So it definitely it was a wonderful session. We have learned a lot from these learned professors. I think, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to remain as chair person of this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, now the uh, uh, final comments from uh, Professor Kazi Tarikul Islam. Uh, Professor Kazi Tarikul Islam uh, was the former governor, uh, ACP chapter Bangladesh. Uh, he was also the uh, professor of medicine, served uh, long in Dhaka Medical College and different renowned medical college hospital. He is a very senior and respected academician of Bangladesh, uh, served in many sphere in Bangladesh College of Physicians, Society of Medicine, APB, and renowned organization. His research interest is uh, arbovirus because I found him very uh, articulated in case of dengue and chikungunya infection. He sits on several chairs, national and international bodies, including WHO. He is also the member of the National Steering Committee of COVID-19 Infection. Uh, run by the government of Bangladesh. Uh, it is our pleasure to invite Professor Kaji Tarikul Islam to express his views. Sir, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rabbi. Uh, it's a really uh, amazing session and more than two and a half hours, uh, it is uh, already elapsed. And we could not understand that we, we are learning a lot. Uh, Though our, uh, we have been named as chair, but uh, today I have learned a lot from the all three speakers. And it was brilliant uh, for, from all these speakers. Uh, and in between, I have asked one or two questions uh, to the speaker because I could not restrain myself. Uh, because uh, you, th you see, I was using the term infodemic because all informations are not true, all information are not correct and sometimes it is uh, uh, biased. Uh, and we should choose the right one. I must uh, thank the speakers. I will not take uh, too much time because uh, everybody uh, in their own field is marvelous, excellent. And uh, I appreciate uh, the authority, the organization, GSTID, and rather the Ben Talks 2020. Uh, we are always with uh, this uh, organization. They have invited me as a chair uh, with others. Uh, and I'm really uh, thankful to them. And with this few words, without any academic anything anymore, if possible, I will request the authority, all this uh, uh, presentation, our, for our attendees, for us, and for archiving. Uh, if you can give it to us, then sometimes we will listen once again. There are many other questions from the mind, but I think the time we have taken, uh, it is a long journey. Three speakers, they have a splendid, they told. Thank you very much, and thanks to everybody. Uh, and I am closing here from my side. Thank you. Uh, over to Rabbi. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, as you rightly said, three hours been passed and it was uh, really splendid. I would like to uh, thank again uh, three of our speakers. I guess uh, Sir Nick somehow disconnected, but I would like to pay uh, our humble gratitude on behalf of half of BSITD and TSB to Professor Dr. Liakota Ali, Professor Susanna and uh, Sir Nick White for their valuable time and be with us for the whole session. I would uh, also like to invite you all that our tomorrow, is, uh, we have a couple of exciting sessions. Tomorrow at 3 p.m. there will be a session on clinical toxicology where distinguished speakers, Professor David Worrell, Professor Michael Adelstone and Professor Ulrich uh, will speak on different aspects. And uh, so uh, thank you very much again. Thanks all the attendees, participants, uh, panelists, senior professors who were being with us um, since three o'clock. Thank you, thank you all. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Prabhu. Thank you, Dr. Prabhu.